Hey everyone, before we get into today's video, just wanted to give you another heads up. I have a new podcast out called Creepscast. It basically is just a compilation of weekly videos posted on the channel available in podcast format. If you guys are interested in that and want to listen to creepypastas on the go, go check it out. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So, if you're interested, go take a look at it. Links are in the description below. And with that, I hope you all enjoy today's story. We lock our doors whenever there's a boneless tide. Written by JTB685 Once a month, the boneless arrives on the tide. It's a force of nature, like quicksand. You can't reason or argue with it. All you can do is barricade your home and stay indoors. Us islanders know when it's coming. We recognize the signs. Now and again, an outsider comes to visit and brushes off the warnings. They think we're all simpletons, or in some sort of crazy cult. When I was a kid, maybe seven or eight, a rich man from the mainland laughed in my mom's face when she told him the boneless was on its way. Mom said half the island warned him to stay inside, but he didn't listen. He even boasted about how he was going to leave his bedroom window open that night, acting all smug like he was proving how stupid we were. Now the nurses wipe his butt and spoon feed him three times a day. It's hard to get away from the island. As a girl, I dreamed of leaving, of seeing the world. But mom got sick and someone had to take care of her, so I quit school. Next thing I knew, I was grown and married to another islander, a fisherman. Fast forward a few years, married life didn't turn out quite how I had envisioned. Unfortunately, mom had a very what will the neighbors think attitude. You see, here on the island, fishermen are well thought of. They're like royalty. And it means divorcing one is like a cardinal sin. Mom buys into the whole shtick, of course. It's hardly surprising. She was married to a fisherman for 20 years. Unfortunately, it meant any time I tried to talk with her about my problems, she took my husband's side. Oh, he's out on the boats all day working hard she would say. I'm sure he doesn't mean it. He's just stressed. I had the same problem with your father. Things will get better soon. Just wait and see. When I would turn up on her doorstep with a busted lip or a bruised neck, she would brush it off. Oh, the storms took a turn for the worse. I'm sure it's tough for him out on the waves. I'm sure his mood will pick up when the weather dies. Just wait and see. Wait and see, wait and see. That was her answer to everything. I was sick of waiting and seeing. And I was sick of my husband. And the whole damn island. All I wanted was a fresh start. For years, I dreamed of doing something. Anything to change my situation. To get out of my rut. Well, tonight, it finally happened. Go down to the market and get some supplies and tidy the house. It's arriving tonight. I'll be at the docks until sundown. Figures. The fishermen are always the first to know. I remember when I was a kid. Dad would take me out on his boat and point to the rainbow-colored sparkles sitting on the waves. That's how we knew the boneless was due for a visit. At midday, I went down to High Street... The islanders were in an uproar. All the merchants wanted to close up early and get home safe. But these shoppers were desperately trying to secure some last-minute provisions. I wandered from store to store, fighting my way through the crowd, picking up the essentials. At the pharmacy, I asked the cashier for some sleeping pills and told him that they were for my mom. She always had trouble sleeping when the boneless is here. Poor thing. He rang them up. You best rush home and get locked up as soon as possible. 
It won't be long now. I will. And give your husband my regards. This time of year, there's nothing out at sea but choppy waters and dangerous winds. Lord knows he needs a decent meal and a warm bed at the end of the day. I brush my hair back, exposing the black eye my husband gave me for talking back last night. For a fraction of a second, a flicker of concern flashed across the pharmacist's face. And then he looked away and started restocking the shelves. I resisted the urge to laugh, as if anyone would ever dare speak a word against a fisherman. We said our goodbyes, and then I started home. Along the way, as I walked along the coastal path, I stopped to watch the ocean waves. Above the surf, rainbow-colored sparkles twisted and twirled. I stood there in a trance-like state, contemplating what I was about to do. An elderly man gave me a nudge in the shoulder. I nearly screamed. It's best not to hang about, he said. There's not much time left. Get home quickly. Don't dawdle. I sighed. Yes, yes, thank you. Further inland, police officers wandered along the cobblestone streets, screaming at people to get indoors. Two of them broke up a gathering of teenagers and shooed them off. I entered my house, made sure it was properly secured, and then cleaned it from top to bottom. When everything was ready, I went into the bathroom and practiced my smile. It looked ingenuine, although that was nothing new. I didn't think my husband would notice, or care. Honey, would you like a glass of whiskey? I said to my reflection. My voice sounded high and peculiar. I cleared my throat. Honey, why don't you have a glass of whiskey? I heard someone say that there had been some choppy waters lately. I thought you might appreciate a little reward for all your hard work. Much better. I waited for my husband, glancing at the clock every now and then. He wandered through the door a little after five and locked the front door. Without saying a word, he tossed me his gear. I hung it up in the closet while he wandered around the house, checking everything was properly secured. Experience had taught me it was best to wait for him to get settled before saying anything. He sat in the armchair by the fireplace and kicked off his boots. Tired? I asked. Of course I'm tired. What's for dinner? How's cod sound? With, um, some potatoes and peas. He held a newspaper in front of his face. Fine. Just try not to burn it this time. I took the steps down to the cellar and flicked on the light switch. Pressed against the stone wall was the freezer. At the far end of the room were the double doors that opened onto the street held together by a metal chain and padlock, the key to which hung from a nail on the wall. I lifted some cod out of the freezer and tucked it under my arm. I carried it into the kitchen, got everything ready and shoved it in the oven. And then I poured my husband a glass of whiskey, ground up three sleeping pills, and mixed them in with his drink. I brought it into him. He turned the paper downward and raised an eyebrow. I heard someone down at the market talking about choppy waters. I thought you might appreciate a little reward for all your hard work. He lifted the glass, downed it in one, and then snapped his fingers for another. For a while, I darted back and forth between the kitchen and the dining room, doting on him. When he had finished the second glass, I poured him a third, then a fourth, and a fifth. Once dinner was ready, I set two plates and I lit a few candles. We didn't talk. We ate. Occasionally, his head nodded back and forth. I held my breath each time. Unfortunately, he kept snapping out of it. He would shake it off and then return to his food. After he finished the main chorus, I fetched him a piece of strawberry pie plus one last drink mixed with two more pills for good measure. He gulped it down without so much as a thank you. For a few moments, we sat in silence. Sweat beaded down my face. 
Eventually, he took himself into the sitting room, back to his favorite armchair. The clock above the mantelpiece had chimed. It was getting late. The boneless would arrive any minute now. I was cutting it close. Real close. My husband's eyelids fluttered, and then his head finally slumped forward. Quietly, I approached the armchair and pulled the newspaper away. Out like a light. Perfect. I grabbed my handbag and coat, and then raced to the front door and unlocked it. I didn't have much time. The street reeked of rotten flowers and spoiled flesh. The aroma was so intense, it stung my nostrils. I took a deep breath, held it, and then walked forward. There came a sickening splat from the end of the street. For a fraction of a second, I looked over and saw it. The boneless. I was too late. The glare blinded me. As I held up my hand to shield my eyes from the light, I had the most wonderful feeling of serenity, a knowledge that everything would be alright, and that I wouldn't have to worry about my husband or the island ever again. Soon, it would all be over. My hand trembled. No, screamed a voice in the back of my head. It's a trick. I had taken several steps forward without realizing it. With a deep breath, I turned away. A chill ran down my spine as I became aware of a horrible writhing sound, like bugs crawling over one another. I raced back to the front door and tried to slam it shut, but I couldn't. Something blocked the frame. A slimy, luminous white blob spilled through the gap. I didn't dare directly look at it. Not again. The door creaked open as the blob expanded, filling the space between the door and frame. With my eyes facing forward the entire time, I raised down the hall. From the sitting room, there came a loud thud. I opened the door. My husband was on the floor, a pool of drool leaking from the corner of his mouth onto the rug. The room lit up as the writhing sound followed me. I bit my bottom lip, clenched my fist. I saw the glow of the boneless reflected in the picture's frames, mounted above the fireplace. The stench was so strong that it made me dry heave. There was no escape. Soon, it would be all over. I had a lifetime of being a vegetable to look forward to. Maybe they would put my husband and me in the same hospital bed, thinking that's what we would want. I had a sudden idea. I rushed forward towards the cellar. My husband stirred. The last thing I saw before exiting the room was him shaking his head. He screamed, but not for long. His voice quieted and then became a terrible gurgle. I resisted the urge to look back. I made my way down the steps into the cellar where I grabbed the key mounted besides the door. My hand trembled so violently it took three attempts to get the key in the padlock. The writhing sound grew louder and louder until it was with me in the room. I unlocked the padlock and then unwrapped the chain from the handles. For a moment, I felt something warm and pulsating touch the back of my ankles. My whole body shivered. At the last possible second, I pushed open the double doors and I climbed onto the street. And then I got up and I ran. I ran halfway across the island, towards my mother's house, where I unlocked the front door and pulled it open. I locked it behind me, pressed my back against the wall, and burst into tears. It was over. I was safe. A light came on at the top of the stairs. I wiped away my tears and I climbed to my feet. My mom appeared, still wearing her nightgown, and asked what had happened. I said that I was worried about her, and then I came to check that she was okay. We embraced. 
she asked about my husband. I told her that he was safe and sound back at home, that I had cooked him his favorite meal, and then came over to check on her. She had insisted she would make up the guest room and tried to lead the way. I kept telling her that I would do it myself until finally she relented. I helped her back into bed and then gave her a kiss on the forehead. I love you, Mom. She rubbed my cheek. I love you too. In the kitchen, I helped myself to a bottle of wine and I broke down in tears. Again, I kept thinking about what I had seen and heard. The awful sounds my husband made played in my mind again and again. I kept thinking about what I could have done differently, about whether there was another way, a simpler one, one that didn't involve anyone getting hurt. I felt a growing knot of guilt in the pit of my stomach, but it's too late to change anything now. Now, all I can do is wait. There is no way I could sleep, not even if I wanted to. At sunrise, the boldness will depart, and then I'll make my way down to the docks and sail my husband's boat to the mainland. I'm finally ready to leave this damn place and never look back. By the time anyone realizes what's happened, I'll be long gone and starting my new life. I can hardly wait. I'm a monster who used to hunt other monsters for the government. Written by Mr. Mills, 45. Through the walls I crawled, my claws quietly clicking against the pipes and cement as all the vermin scattered in my presence. After I put an end to Dr. West, the agency had been riled up, looking all over the entire state for me. Their prized killing machine. All in all, that's what I was to them. A means to an end. An attack dog. Anything they offered me was only to keep me in the dark. To prevent me from turning on them. It was a nothing but false compassion. Once I had gotten a taste of freedom, I knew what had to happen. I knew I couldn't allow myself to keep being their puppet. So I left, got captured, and then broke out and killed the woman who created me. A woman who was much closer in personality to a witch rather than a scientist. For what I perceived as about a month, I'd been living in the walls of the facility, feeding off whatever rodents and small animals I could get my claws on. Everything from possums to spiders to rats. You see, this way... I can live right under their noses. Sure, it's cramp and whatnot, but it's a sacrifice that is well worth it. I could tell the search teams they were sending out were getting exhausted. It was becoming a waste of resources going out there to try and find me. The higher-ups probably knew it, whoever they were. Not that it was truly a concern of mine. So one night, I decided I was going to leave. I was done being cooped up in the walls of this building. I figured I had given the situation enough time for the agency to slow down on their efforts. At least for now. I had a plan and an ally. Someone on the inside who could help me. Dr. John. He owed me for saving his life previously. I figured asking for a favor like this shouldn't be an issue. I got down on all fours and crept my way into the air ducts. The air ducts that I was now all too familiar with, seeing as I had been using them to eavesdrop on all the personnel in the building. That's how I found out things were getting less tense. I crawled my way over to the science wing, near the area that I was created, being careful to keep my claws from scratching any of the material and giving away my location by making too much noise. No, John. This all started because you're an incompetent fool. 16A is gone because you just couldn't listen to West. And now, not only is she probably six feet under, but that monstrosity she created is out there eyeing us next. 
the voice bellowed out from below. I trailed further up the duct and peered down through one of the covers, picking up the familiar scent of Dr. John. The room below was a pristine, sterilized white, unlike pretty much all the labs in this building. Dr. John and his apparent rival stood less than two feet apart. The other scientist shouted at him with a fury that I had never seen before. What was I supposed to do? Came John's rebuttal. West is a psychopath, hell. Most of you in here are. I don't even know why I took this job in the first place. The other scientist recoiled, taking a step back and adjusting his lab coat. John, he stepped closer. We both know full well why you took this job. You want to study the things that aren't of this earth. The things that go bump in the night, right? Because it was one of those things that took your daughter, isn't it? Immediately, John cocked his fist and threw a vicious blow at the man, following up his punch with an angry tirade. I swear to God, don't you ever use my daughter like that again, do you hear me? Keep her name out of your mouth before I shove a bottle of acid in it. The scientist who had taken the hit swung back, connecting a punch with John's left cheek. They quickly broke down into a full-on fight, a windmill of punches and grappling to get the upper hand on one another. It seemed appropriate at this point to intervene. I slipped my claws through the slit in the cover to the air duct, applied some force, and tore it off. And by the time they both realized that I was on the ceiling above them, I had already dropped down. What the? exclaimed the unnamed scientist as I pounced at him and I cut his speech short. I quickly lifted him up by the neck and slung his body across the room, as if he were a stuffed animal, causing him to slam violently into the wall and be knocked unconscious. Subject 16A, uh, thank you. Where did you come from? Dr. John inquired. Braun, I stated bluntly. My name is Braun. Right, sorry, Braun it is. Once again, thanks for that. And also, I didn't get the chance to thank you for sparing me a while back when you escaped. But I see you didn't share the same mercy for Dr. West. I honestly don't blame you. John tilted his head up as I towered over him, fixating on my light bulb shaped eyes and the contrast of my blue skin to the polished white marble of the room. I spared your life, Doctor, I said. Now I need you to perform a similar courtesy for me. And that is, John raised an eyebrow. Help me escape unseen. Get out of this wretched place. I've been here long enough, feeding off the creatures that lurk in the walls. It's time for me to go back out where I belong, to freedom. John paused for a moment, thinking critically about what I had just said. Yeah, I think I can do that. After the higher-ups decided Dr. West was more than likely dead, they bumped me up to head of the science division. That choice was done more out of necessity than qualification, but they needed someone in charge as quickly as possible. Security keeps an eye on everything that goes in and out of this building, so that will be a bit of a challenge. No worry about the physical threats, I replied, spreading my fingers and allowing my claws to be put on full display. There's also one more thing, John added. I want to come with you. I have a feeling the higher-ups aren't too happy with me being at fault for letting you out of captivity in the first place. Things are getting strange around here. People aren't telling me stuff they should be. Something tells me that I won't be in this position for very long. I simply nodded my head in agreement, fully empathizing with John's decision. Although we had different reasons for our long-awaited departure from the agency, it was clear we both understood full well they aren't what they pretend to be. After a bit more discussion, John and I got to work on how to get ourselves out of here. I, of course, was mainly reduced to sneaking around and doing reconnaissance, while John played the system from the inside, manipulating the guards and using his title to gain access to whatever we may have needed. John called over one of the commanding guards with a special keycard that we needed to access the weapons room. In case things went wrong, 
I needed John to be able to defend himself. So I told him to stock up on whatever he was capable of concealing underneath his lab coat. It wasn't just the human security personnel that we had to worry about. But other cryptids had been captured and contained in the building. At first, the plan was to sneak past and avoid absolutely everyone and everything. But then the idea of using one or two of the cryptids as a distraction came to mind. And seeing as the first option was highly unlikely to be successful. Later that night, when the sun was beginning to set, and the activity in the facility died down, I went back up into the vents to look around to make sure the coast was clear, on the way to the cryptid containment cells. Soon enough, these shifts would rotate and the night guards would emerge. I set my sights on one of the Wendigo cages, the reason being that one, the guards had the firepower to subdue a Wendigo without much blood being shed, and two, because Wendigos are fast, agile, and quick, they're deceitful and manipulate the voices of the victim's loved ones. I would know, seeing as I've had to take down a few myself. Once I arrived at the cryptid containment cells, I looked up and down the hall, making sure no guards were currently posted. I didn't have much time before they would switch shifts, so I had to move fast. I tightly gripped the keycard Dr. John had given me, intending to use it on the cage. I crept across the ceiling on all fours, scaled my way down the wall, and stood up in a bipedal fashion, staring at the Wendigo of choice through the glass of his cell, which had been specially soundproofed in order to prevent him from successfully using his voice mimicking ability. He glared at me angrily through the glass with those sunken eyes in that deer skull, Clearly still bitter that I was the main entity who had been the reason he was in here in the first place. I swiped the keycard to his cell. A quiet beep went off and the glass wall began to lower itself into the floor, allowing the Wendigo to freely move forward. Immediately, he attacked me by lunging. I grabbed him by the rotting flesh of his body and gripped my other hand around the mouth of his deer skull, keeping his jaw restrained with my strength. You'll obey me or I'll kill you. Is that understood? I snarled, baring my teeth to intimidate the opposing creature and establish dominance. The Wendigo still tried to wiggle free and fight the hold that I had put him in, but I only tightened my grip and kept him in place as he fought to get away. In order to intimidate him further, I spread my fingers with my free hand and allowed my claws to be seen by him just inches away from his eyes. It was clear that he knew that my threat was serious. He quickly gave up fighting, when he realized my physical power was too great for him to combat. As I held him in place, the Wendigo then began to mimic the voice of Dr. John in order to speak to me. You're unlike the others. You are strong, very strong. He complimented, his jaw not moving as he spoke. Thank you. Now what I need you to do is distract the humans, the ones in the black. Do not kill them or cause serious harm to them. They will surely eliminate you if you do so. And believe me when I say, they have the means to put an end to your existence. The Wendigo stood silent for a moment, contemplating my statement as he laid against the wall, still pinned down by my hold. And what should I get in return for my efforts? He asked, his voice almost echoing it within my head. I will come back for you. I will help you get back to freedom, so long as you make me one promise that you'll be faithful to. And that is, the cryptid scowled, his mouth still motionless. You shall never kill and seek out another human again. You shall only feast on what nature provides. Unless a human has initiated conflict and desires to cause you great harm, you will leave them be. I know what you are, how you became this monstrosity. But if you are able to fight your lust, your thirst for their flesh and bone, I will see it that you are free once again if you assist me. I had never seen a more shot expression on any entity before human, animal, or cryptid. 
The Wendigo was genuinely dumbfounded to be shown such understanding and compassion. I lowered my guard, taking my claw off of his jaw, and I allowed him to straighten his posture. What are you? He asked, still continuing to mimic the voice of John. I am not them, not these ones. The humans are worth saving, but these ones are corrupted far beyond repair. I know that you were one of them some time ago, and there is still that spirit of empathy dwelling deep inside you, even if your bloodlust tells you otherwise. I could tell that he was highly conflicted. He silently went back and forth in his mind, trying to grasp the gravity of what I was proposing. I encouraged him to hurry up and come to a decision. We wouldn't have much longer before the night shift guards started making their rounds. I shall do it, he finally announced to me, tilting the nose of his deer skull upwards and focusing those lifeless eyes towards the end of the hallway. I will return for you. You have my word. I said latching onto the wall next to me as I began to crawl back up into the air duct entrance. We gave each other one last glance of recognition before going our separate ways. I did truly intend to come back for him, sooner than one might think. I had spent so much time serving humanity, I had never tried to connect with other cryptids. Not like this. In all fairness, most creatures usually didn't care for my sympathy, but he was different. There was a spark in him, a lasting remnants of his humanity. I just needed to keep doing everything I could to bring it to the surface. Security breach at level 5. All possible agents engage. Came the sound of a female voice over the speaker. It was apparent that they had realized the Wendigo was out of containment. Time was running out. I had sped up and scurried along the duct, following Dr. John's scent all the way to the north end of the building, where he would be waiting for me. I had released the Wendigo on the south end. I could hear the footsteps of all these soldiers progressing down the opposite direction that I was heading in. Most of them cursing and swearing about having to respond to the security alert at such a late hour. I made it to where I needed to be, climbed out of the air docks, and dropped down into the transportation garage, the place where shipments of supplies were sent in and out from the facility. John was waiting for me in one of the transport trucks, the engine running and the back doors to the storage crate open. I jumped in the back of the truck, closing the doors behind me and heading over closer to the cab where John was driving. A job well done, doctor. I complimented as he pulled out and headed for the exit of the building perimeter. Normally, the place was looked over by guards and the towers and wendigos, but since they were all busy with the wendigo, that wasn't much of an issue. Even these security cameras weren't able to detect anything out of the ordinary. The windows on the truck were heavily tinted, obscuring the figure of Dr. John, buying us enough time to disappear. So far, everything had gone the way it should have. We had made it out seemingly undetected. The plan had truly gone perfectly. I spoke with the Wendigo. We have to go back for him sometime soon, I told John, to which he snapped his head back in response, taking his eyes off the road momentarily. What? He practically spazzed. I made a promise to him that we would return and retrieve him, to release him into freedom. You want to let another Wendigo roam free? Yeah, because that's just what the world needs, isn't it? You fail to understand him the way that I do. He is not like the others. I think that I can get him to overcome his bloodlust, to not feed on your species. He's a damn Wendigo, Braun. Are you really just going to trust what he says because you struck up a deal with him? Just keep driving, doctor, I said sternly. We had gotten about 12 miles out. By this point, they had more than likely subdued and put the Wendigo back into containment, and were going to soon realize that Dr. John was gone from the building. We're past the point of no return, John announced. I can't ever go back. Not without being shot anyway. We'll devise a plan, doctor, that I can guarantee you 
but I will go back for him, whether you join me or not. John went silent for a moment as he took a turn, clearly wanting this disagreement to cease. We need to hurry up and leave this truck behind, he said, ignoring my statement. There's a good chance they could have a tracker on it. I question as to why they didn't put one on me, I added. When Dr. West was in the process of designing you, she never thought that it would be necessary. She thought that you would be grateful for what the agency was giving you, as far as shelter and food. For a woman who was so scientifically gifted and smart, she was quite the fool. Trust me when I say that you made the right choice when you chewed her up. The world is much better off without her. I presume she showed you very little kindness as well. I responded. Definitely. Always belittling me every chance she got, no matter what I did. She was always the better scientist. Even took credit for some of the work here and there. Once a few hours had passed and we had traveled nearly a hundred miles, John pulled the truck into an abandoned parking lot for an old law firm building, making this portion of our trip come to an uneventful end. From here, we'll head over to the nearby forest to wait it out for a bit. John pronounced as he retrieved a handgun from his pocket. I also brought a grenade, if you were wondering. Brilliant idea, doctor. But you remember what must happen when things calm down. I told him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He waved me off in a lighthearted fashion. We both exited the vehicle through our separate ways and began a journey over to the woods. It was only minutes after when I stopped us after an idea had hit me. Shall we destroy the truck? I proposed, giving John a subtle glance. No, that'll attract way too much attention and come off as suspicious. For now, just let them find it. They'll be busy with that piece of evidence and less focused on us. We continued our trek into the untamed landscape. I'll be truthful when I say it felt quite irritating having to move so slow in comparison to what I was used to in order to keep pace with John. The trees were much more dense and plentiful in this particular forest, more so than any other I had seen before. Vegetation was all around us, growing with seemingly no intention of slowing down. We were only about a mile deep into the train. I intended to go at least at ten times that before we had stopped for the day. Suddenly, I picked up a scent. A strong, intoxicating smell of something from above. I wasn't entirely sure what it was, but it was coming closer by the second. I could tell that it was moving fast, right in our vicinity. Prepare yourself. I can smell something strong, I said, to which John gripped his handgun. I glanced up into the sky, trying to spot whatever was approaching us. Do you know what it is? John asked. A nervous expression crept its way onto his face. No, but you need to get down. Before I could finish my sentence, I was quickly hit with a powerful blow hard enough to send me soaring through the air and slamming into a nearby tree. The hit had dazed me, but only slightly. I was able to quickly get up and recover standing up and finally getting a look at my attacker. In front of me was a giant avian creature of some sort. It was massive, even taller than me as it stood on the ground. Its wingspan had to be more than 20 feet, speaking of which. Its wings were a dark purple color, most of its body was. The head of the creature was shaped like that of a rectangle. It didn't have much of a neck, but towards its lower half, it possessed huge, razor-sharp talons that could more than likely hold an entire car in them. Its anatomy was as terrifying as it was strange, not to mention its lengthy black beak with the multiple rows of jagged teeth, some of which had flesh still stuck between them from previous meals and victims. Blood also coated the edges of its beak. John immediately began to fire his handgun at the cryptid, hitting it with several shots in the wings. This seemed to only anger the entity, despite the fact that its bullets penetrated the tissue. It spread its wings further and let out an ear-shattering screech in John's direction. I quickly approached the cryptid to begin my attack. 
He turned his head to me, preparing for our fight. I pounced up from the ground and out of the creature's body, raising my claws to slash at its head before it subtly jolted itself upwards into the air, causing me to fall off and back onto the ground. John had tried to run, but the creature was far too swift for him, swooping down in and grabbing his tender figure in those massive talons. Help! Bron, please help! He screamed as the cryptid began to lift him into the air, looking at John hungrily as he eagerly waited to feast on his organs. The creature then began to fly in the opposite direction, going deeper into the forest. I quickly got down on all fours and began to chase after it, putting every ounce of effort possible into keeping up with the entity. I leaped over rocks, launched onto trees, and jumped from one trunk to another. This creature was fast, but I was gaining ground and closing the gap. The only problem was that I would have to wait until he landed to follow up with an attack, and by that point, John could either be dead or severely injured. Let me go, he shouted, before trying to kick his way out of the creature's talons, even attempting to shoot him once again, but the gun had clicked when he pulled the trigger, confirming the magazine was empty. I noticed that as the chase went on, the trees in the forest seemed to mysteriously become bigger, more girthy, and even taller in height. The trunks were becoming large enough to house a family of entities inside. This forest was by far a cryptid hotspot. It broke all sorts of biological and natural laws. A perfect place for some curious humans to wander into and find themselves being stalked by whatever lurks within these trees. When the avian creature had started to slow down with John still in its grasp, I picked up the scent of several more beings that smelled just like him. I turned my attention upwards, High up in what was by far the biggest tree we had passed so far, sat a gigantic nest, filled with several smaller versions of the avian creature that had snatched John up. It was a female after all. Offspring, I thought. This thing was going to feed John alive to its offspring. Despite being much smaller than their mother and lacking any sort of teeth, they were still sizable enough to easily rip John apart as if he were nothing more than a worm with limbs. And without any ammo left in his weapon to defend himself, that would soon become his agonizing reality. I latched onto the trunk of the tree and hurried north as fast as I could. The offspring of the creature pointed their beaks and squawked excitedly at the sight of their mother approaching with a fresh meal. The hunger was palpable in their eyes. I was halfway up the tree when the mother let out another ground rumbling screech in my direction. The hideous mother had dropped John into the nest. The offspring immediately converged in him, and I was only feet away. Hey, stay back, get away from me, he demanded, desperately trying to swat them off and delay his impending doom. One lunged its beak in John's direction, to which John responded by throwing a punch and clocking him at the tip. Even though it did practically nothing to stop the young creature, his courage was admirable. His seconds were dwindling, and he didn't have much time left. One of the offspring had grabbed him by the arm when I finally made it up into the nest and jammed my claws into the underside of his beak, causing it to release a shrill, so unpleasant my very body vibrated from the forest. You gotta remember, my hearing is far better than a human's. So while John had complained, my ear canals were brutally stinging from the sound waves bursting through them. The mother was extremely distraught with what I had done to her child. In retaliation, she attempted to swoop down and ram me with her beak, but it missed and instead impacted John, who fell out of the nest and tumbled down to a lower branch on the tree, hanging on for dear life as I tried to make quick work of these satanic birds. And two of the offspring had simultaneously grabbed my arms. I could feel the slimy, saliva-coated flesh of their throats as my hands sank deeper into their esophagus. I countered their efforts by flipping my hands palms up while still inside them and then straightened my fingers to extend my claws outwards. This caused them to pierce through the backs of their necks, 
which I then followed up by dragging my arms vertically towards the sky until I had reached their brains, instantly killing them. They dropped to the floor of the nest as a dark purple blood had oozed out from their now punctured skulls, soaking the nest beneath us. The mother was now furious, angrier than ever before. It was obvious that she wanted to tear me to shreds and make me suffer for what I had done. She flew and did a U-turn in midair, circling back and flying towards me as fast as possible while performing another one of her deafening shrills. She proceeded to pull her wings in closer toward her body, increasing her speed as she barreled towards me. I drew my claws out, preparing for the inevitable collision. When she hit me, I was sent flying off the nest and slamming into the top of another tree. But with the speed and force that I had been collided with, I fell down nearly the entire length of the tree, snapping and cracking a multitude of branches on my way as I descended. When my fall had come to a halt, I was preparing to jump and crawl back to the top to continue the fight just before John's voice had stopped me. Braun, take this. He had shouted from below. I turned my attention and lowered my eyes to John, who stood at the bottom of the tree with boots on the ground. I concluded that he must have climbed down the branches while I was going to work on the aerial cryptid. In his hand, he held a grenade, which I am quite familiar with. I had seen men use them all the time back at the agency during our expeditions. Wait, doctor, don't pull the pin just yet, I commanded holding out a hand towards his direction to motion him to seize his movements. I was going to use it when she had snatched me up, but I couldn't get a chance to reach into my lab coat. He continued on. When she flies down here, shove this down her beak and take out that flying son of a gun. I wiggled two of my fingernails in an overhear motion. John tossed the grenade to me. I caught it and grasped it firmly in my hand as I tilted my head up to the sky. The giant bird was making another circular lap, coming back for a third blow. Wanted to time it just right to avoid a disaster, I made sure to wait for the perfect opportunity. Concentrating on how fast she was closing the distance and deciding from there, I pulled the pin when she was around 50 feet away. The intent, hunger for revenge, and malice in her beady eyes were unlike anything I had witnessed before. She truly wanted to make sure that I suffered at her hand. Once she got in range, I jumped up, wrapping myself around her feathery body and digging my claws into her back, making sure to drag them up and slice her flesh for some extra damage. She howled, trying to wiggle mid-flight and shake me off, but it was futile. I reached into her beak during screams of agony and shoved the grenade down her throat as quickly as possible making sure to avoid those serrated teeth. I then retracted my claws from her back and let go, falling off and sliding across the ground while kicking up dirt from the leftover momentum of our struggle. I quickly recovered, getting up and turning around to witness what was about to come. She kept soaring through the air, presumably to make another circle to hit me, but as she began to turn, a small but sudden boom erupted from the depths of her beak, echoing off the surrounding trees. Nearly half of her head had been taken off and destroyed by the explosion, exposing her weirdly shaped skull and coating the vegetation nearby in her now signature dark purple blood. My God, John exclaimed from behind. That was just... I don't even know how to describe it. We did it. I hoped to kill a freaking cryptid. And for the first time in nearly my entire life, I smiled. Amused by John's enthusiasm and proud of our teamwork, I scurried over back to him. He held out his hand in the air for some strange reason as I approached. Why are you doing that, doctor? I inquired. It's a high five. You've never done it before. No, but uh, I'd be willing to try. I reached out my right hand and slapped my palm against his, to which he immediately snarled in pain as he grasped his wrist. Ah, I forgot about the strength. I'll be fine. He whined, vigorously shaking his hand. We should quiet down, doctor, I told him, before something else hears us. Right, right, he followed up. 
Well, uh, I guess you could say that I'm the brains and you're the brawn. I turned and simply looked at him with a blank expression. He seemed to be slightly skittish, blushing mildly as he rubbed the hand that I had slapped with mine. Let's get moving. I know what's causing the earthquakes in Iceland. It's not what you think. Written by Kafka Lover I found the following record saved as an audio file on my roommate Mina's computer. From the tabs that were open on her browser, it seemed like she was trying to transcribe the recording that posted here. I didn't know her very well, but she was a lovely girl and she'll be missed. I finished part of the transcription, and I'm not sure what to make of it. Maybe you all will have better insight. If there is any interest, I'll be sure to finish the rest of the file. Cheers. KL uh, God, where do I start? I already submitted this information to the university two days ago. Now I might even be subject to uh, disciplinary action. They think it's a hoax. Like I would jeopardize my dissertation. My entire future. No, uh, okay. I'll begin at the beginning. Like David freaking Copperfield. Right. The beginning. The following is a record of the University of Iceland investigation of the ice cave in Vatnajökull Glacier, near Jökulskau Lagoon. Good, that sounds official. I'll edit all this before I write it down. My name is Amina Brown. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Iceland in Viking and Medieval Norse Studies. My specialty is Runology with an interest in comparing runic inscriptions in Iceland, Greenland, and Newfoundland. I intend to prove that Viking settlement expanded beyond Lance Ox Meadows and moved south towards Maine. Maybe even... Uh, never mind. You don't need my CV. Jesus. If I still have a job tomorrow. If I'm still alive tomorrow. If you don't know... There's been non-stop earthquakes shaking the country for the past week. It's not severe here in Reykjavik, but you can feel like constant vibration beneath your feet, like the earth is trembling. We got word a few days ago that a group of tourists found something curious near Yokoskau, some kind of inscriptions in a cave beneath the ice. This struck me immediately as strange because there aren't any known Viking settlements or archaeological sites in the Yokoskau area. The hypothesis was that the earthquakes must have shaken some ice or rocks loose, maybe exposed something that had been long buried. The tour group operator phoned the university who, though skeptical, couldn't afford to pass up a possible grant opportunity. Which is how I found myself in the car with Professor Jonsson and Jacob Andersen, a research fellow from Norway, making the five-hour trek to Yokoskau. Professor Jonsson, whose specialty is medieval Norse linguistics, was clearly unhappy at being tapped for the assignment. Really, we had all drawn the shit end of the stick. I remember him ranting not even 30 minutes outside of town, something about a stupid tourist and children's graffiti, and couldn't even be bothered to take pictures, and calling it Instagram, until Jacob had corrected him. I had to agree that the lack of pictures was strange. Every tourist in Iceland carries a camera. He must be right, I thought. Almost certainly some kind of prank. The hours rolled onward from the back seat, watching low mountains rise and fall in the distance. Iceland is so different from England, like an alien world. You can see the glaciers on the horizon peeking out from between the curves of rock, 
blue-gray with hearts of black. Something about the glaciers always have filled me with dread. They're primeval somehow, old, a forest outside of time. God, if only I knew then. I had been to Yokelsal before, but walking up the crest of the rock to the lagoon below felt, well, different this time. Yokelsal is a glacier lake, a giant pool of freezing water studded with arctic blue ice. Enormous pieces even line the shore, some the size of your hand, others as large as boulders, giving these sands the tourist nickname, Diamond Beach. When we arrived though, it was late afternoon, and I remember thinking that the icebergs were floating slowly through the water like ghosts. I recall so clearly that there was a lone seal creating a wake where the lagoon met the ocean. All before, a sudden tremor ripped through the ground, throwing me off balance. The final tours of the day had ended, and the food trucks parked to the side were packing up to leave. The tour guide who found the inscriptions, a man named Aaron, I don't remember his last name, but Aaron, wearing a red jacket, met us at the cafe on the far side of the lagoon. He explained that he had been taking the tourist around the lagoon by boat, when he noticed a large cave opening, where none existed before, tucked into the side of the glacier. He waved us onwards, assuring us that it was just a short walk. The cave opening was immediately significant in itself. A high arc. It was obvious from 10 meters away that it had been carved from the stone rather than created by natural forces. Even Professor Jonsson gasped, rushing closer to run his hands over the markings. The sides of the entryway were bordered by intricate cross hatches in the rock. Lines with the interlocking circles typical of Norse art. It was so well preserved that the carvings could have been made yesterday, with very little signs of erosion. Aaron seemed pleased by our reaction, leaving to wait by the lagoon until we were finished with our preliminary inspection. It was Jacob who first pointed out the creatures and runic carvings above the cave opening. I stood on my tiptoes, trying to get a better look, until Professor Jonsson yelled for Aaron to bring over some boxes that held the life vests for the tour boat. We managed to stack them like a stair against the rock, getting about two meters off the ground. I thought from below that they were a narwhal, maybe seal, but at eye level, the carvings were confusing. At first glance, they only passively resembled images that I was familiar with. I remember there was a long silence as we studied them, taking turns up and down the boxes. Professor Jonsson proposed that the middle carving was Yudrezel, the world tree, with the nine other carvings on either side representing the nine worlds. I initially agreed with his hypothesis, but this carving looked like nothing I had ever seen before. For one, the branches seemed like they were drooping, withered, like the tree was dying. And the most obvious change was a carving of some enormous animal at its base, its appendages mending with the branches of the tree above. Jacob suggested it could be a giant squid. The carving had tentacles, true, and the face was like an octopus. But as I bent closer, I could see clawed feet gripping the roots of the tree, and long, narrow wings that stretched away from either side. It was a chimera, some horrible mixture of land and sea and air that made me deeply uncomfortable. And then, the markings to the side... What Professor Jonsson said were the nine worlds. I was just looking at them when the professor called me inside the cave. But they seemed like snakes, horned things, more terrible combinations of creatures that couldn't exist. 
I followed Professor Janssen and Jacob into the cave itself, which opens quickly into an incredible blue amphitheater of ice. All around us were dozens of runestones, assembled in concentric circles from the back to the center of the room, ending in a spiral of polished white stones in the very middle. The professor was following the circles, moving from stone to stone excitedly. I think it's Nostrand. I remembered him saying, the darkest realm of the Norris underworld. I glanced at some of the carvings on the closest stones. There were skulls what looked like flames, and then the tentacled thing again, rising as if from the center of a mountain. It didn't have any of the usual depictions of the underworld, these serpents and dragons typical of the mythology. I walked to the center of the room, to the spiral. Something about it made me shudder, drew me with a nauseous unease. I bent down, ran my hand over it. The stones were more ivory than white, notched on the edges. I know what I reeled upwards finding Jacob just behind me. I think they're bone, I said. He nodded. I didn't add what else I had suspected. Human bone. It seemed ridiculous to say at the time. Surely they were a seal or sheep. Whale maybe, I told myself. Professor Janssen was moving towards the back of the ice cave gesturing towards three tunnels that led away from the main chamber. He wanted to explore them. Professor, I said, we've done what we set out to do. This can't be a hoax. If it is, it's one of the most elaborate Viking hoaxes ever created. Surely we've verified that there's a find worthy of further investigation. Professor Jonsson protested, he was enthusiastic, almost agitated, talking very quickly. He was insistent that we go down the tunnels. Even just one tunnel, he said finally, to quickly see if there was another chamber. I should have said no. We all should have said no. But Professor Jonsson was the head of our department, and though neither of us had worked closely with him before, our funding was based on his approval. Crap. We were cowards. I saw it too in Jacob's eyes. When the professor left to ask Aaron outside for a robe, he was nervous. Upset. I'm not sure Professor Jonsson is correct about those carbines, he said, once we were out of earshot. I've never seen anything like them, and my specialty is Norris at picture stones. I agreed with him. The artwork and rune style seemed Norris, but the subject matter was completely foreign, not to mention disturbing. Professor Jonsson wasn't even an expert in art. He was a linguistics professor for heck's sake. No, okay, documentation purposes. Try to be more objective. Fine, objective. That was when Professor Jonsson returned with a line that he had fixed to something outside the cave entrance, pulling the slack behind him. Anyone want to pick a tunnel? There was a long silence when we didn't reply. All right, the tunnel on the left, it is, he said, disappearing into the darkness. He had the single torch and we walked down the tunnel for about 15 meters or so before seeing a pale light shining ahead. At first, we thought it was daylight, but it became clear as we entered a second chamber that it came from the ceiling. Millions of microdots of aquamarine phosphorescence. There is a small pool in the center too, glowing the same ethereal green. I remember staring at the ceiling open-mouthed as Jacob and the professor argued about the origins of the biomaterial. Glowworms, Professor Jonsson said. I saw them in New Zealand. Something about the dots didn't seem exactly right to me. 
they weren't random as you would expect them to be. And I started to pick familiar shapes and patterns out of the clusters of light. Constellations, I said. I think they're constellations. Nobody heard me. Jacob insisted that glowworms don't exist in Iceland, bending down to get a better look at the pool of water. It's probably plankton, he said, taking off his glove and sweeping his hand through the water. And that's when everything fell apart. Jacob screamed. His hand emerged, hissing from the pool, the skin half gone from the bone. He was holding the wrist with his good hand, screaming and screaming. God, it's like I can still hear it. Professor Jonsson was frozen. First aid, I remember yelling, bending down next to Jacob. Do we have first aid? Aaron must, in the boat for the tourists, he said, running back towards the tunnel entrance. And that was when we realized the tunnel entrance had disappeared. It can't be gone. I know I said, still holding Jacob as best I could, trying not to look at his hand. It just can't be freaking gone. The rope was gone too, we realized. The severed end of it lying on the cave floor, cleanly sliced in half. A rock fall. Maybe there was another quake. Let's wait for Aaron then, I said. He knows we're here. He can dig us out. Jacob screaming had quieted to a whimper his hand still smoking in the dim light. I knew even then that there had been no earthquake and no rockfall. I know it sounds mad, but one minute the tunnel entrance was there, and the next it wasn't. Like we had slipped through the fingers of the cave to some upside-down world, and I knew with certainty even then that no one was coming to save us. Something sinister happened when I visited my grandpa in Siberia. To this day, I don't quite understand it. Written by Chupacabra I'm from Russia, so please pardon my grammar. I'm so confused in looking for answers. I have posted this many times on Russian supernatural forums, but still haven't found any clues. This happened about 15 years ago. I was around 11 at the time. Me and my parents lived in a relatively large city in Ural. The city is famous for its massive industrial complex and polluted air, which is evident in the summer. So every year my parents would send me on to visit my grandpa in Siberia for two to three weeks so that I could breathe in some fresh air. Even though it meant that I would spend some of the sweet summer days away from my friends, I always eagerly awaited these trips. The thing is, my grandpa was one of the most interesting people I've met to this day. He was an archaeologist and specialized in Slavic mythology and rituals. Aside from the fact that he was obviously very knowledgeable in history and culture, he traveled the whole country and had most entertaining stories from his expeditions. He was like a real life Indiana Jones to me. 20 years ago, his team discovered a massive network of ancient villages in Siberia. So they built a permanent research camp with all the facilities. They even had showers and electricity. Junior staff members lived in tents in temporary buildings and academic officers like my grandpa had wooden cottages. It was a remote, very isolated location, so the route to the camp was not an easy one. That year, my dad and grandpa agreed that dad would drive me to a small Siberian town in his car, where grandpa would pick me up. After 10 hours of driving, I was sleepy most of the time. We met up with grandpa at the arranged location. We went to a local buffet where dad and grandpa exchanged the latest news. And then Grandpa said to me, Well, Pioneer, time for us to hit the road. Dad went back to his car to have a nap before driving home, and we headed to a river pier, where my Grandpa's colleague waited for us in a boat. Let me introduce you, 
Grandpa said. This is my grandson. He's a very smart lad. And this is Stefan Petrovich. He specializes in ritual burials. This spring, we discovered an amazing mound on the bank of the river, one hour away from our camp. A very untypical one, too. So, Stephen Petrovich is helping us make sense of it. I gave Stephen a polite nod, and to which he responded, What are you, a girl? Men shake hands. He had a very firm handshake. I had mixed feelings about this guy. He seemed a little gruff. To be honest, I was a little afraid of him, and wished that he wasn't with us. But then he and Grandpa started exchanging stories and anecdotes, and I realized that he was a fun guy, just a little rough around the edges. I even started to tell him my school stories like when we had pranked our teacher by covering the chalkboard in wax, and he seemed to like them. After two hours of sailing, we had finally arrived. A spectacular landscape opened before my eyes. A huge mound right on the bank of the river. It looked so monumental and fearsome in the setting sun. I would think that I'd traveled back in time, if not for the researchers' tents surrounding the hill. There it is. Magnificent, isn't it? My grandpa said. One of these staff members helped us from the boat and greeted me and then addressed my grandpa. His name was Valentin Bogdanovich. My grandpa said, We need you to take a look at something before the shift ends. Sure, just a moment, he replied. Hey, Stefan, will you please show our young fellow around? I'll be right back and we all will head to our camp. So, we went on a little tour with Stefan. Your grandpa's a great researcher, so I assume you know some basics about the culture of ancient Slavs. This burial that we have here is a very large one. Usually, collected burials are associated with military clashes. They contain remains of fallen warriors. Well, it's not the case here. It looks like an entire village of peaceful serfs were pillaged by a forest fire. But we also consider the possibility of a mass offering. The corpses are burnt but not cremated, which is not typical. What is even more unusual, instead of regular ritual weapons, there are iron sickles, one per body. Some militant cult might have raided the village and made a mass sacrifice. He made a spooky face. Usually scary stories didn't impress me much, but the atmosphere of the Siberian summer night did the job. I felt uneasy. Soon my grandpa came back and we were on our way to the camp. The camp was at the edge of the forest, about an hour away from the river, separated from it by an enormous field of wild rye. Grandpa, I said, if this village was pillaged by a militant cult, is it theoretically possible that their successors are still hiding out there in the forest? Grandpa gave Stefan a condemning glare. The old bandit, how dare you scare a child? Stefan responded with a guilty look. Sorry, Professor. I'm just not used to being around children. I'll have to watch what I say. We arrived at the camp. After ten hours of resting in my father's car, I didn't feel sleepy at all. So my grandpa decided to throw a little party to celebrate my arrival. Me, Grandpa, Stefan, and a few staff members gathered around the campfire. I felt a lot more relaxed in a large group. So, I suggested a contest for the scariest story. Well, we are scientists who study mythology, so it would not be easy to beat us, Grandpa chuckled. By the way, do you know why people come up with scary stories? You see, we are a lot smarter than animals, which makes us both powerful and vulnerable. Our perception of reality is so acute it would be insufferable for us to cope with all the bad things that can happen, if not for our ability to come up with explanations. For example, our ancestors really like saunas, but even something as fun and relaxing as bathing can be dangerous. A person could overheat and have a cardiac attack or something. Ancient Slavs had a strict set of rules when it came to bathing. First of all, 
you must never go to the sauna alone. Second, you must never fall asleep in the sauna. And most importantly, never bathe after the sunset. All these rules make sense if you think about them rationally, because violating them could result in a fatal accident. But our ancestors came up with another explanation. They believed there is a demon who came to those who broke the rules. The demon kissed them and exhaled hot air into their lungs, killing them. This is the power of the collective unconscious. These rules really do make sense if you think about them, I replied. And I can understand where this legend is coming from. But why does the demon only come out after midnight? Why do all the bad things and scary stories always happen after midnight? Well, nights are dangerous because our perception is not that good. Even ordinary things can appear scary in the darkness. But our ancestors believed that midnight was not the only dangerous time of the day. There were four borderline times when the line between the natural world and the spirit world blurs. Midnight, sunrise, sunset, and midday. Did I ever tell you about the midday lady? The midday lady is the spiritual manifestation of a hot day, when it is too dangerous to work in the fields because of potential sunstrokes. During that time of the day, serfs would shut down any field work and go back home to wait out the midday. If you stay in the field or even worse, if you fall asleep there, the midday lady would kill you. The following few days in the camp were nothing but entertaining. I didn't feel worried even though we were stranded in a Siberian forest near an ancient burial. Being surrounded by rationally thinking adults focused on their work had a relaxing effect on me. Most of the time, we were in the camp. Grandpa worked for five to six hours every day, and I spent this time exploring his amazing library. And then we would dine with the other researchers and go on a little hike around the camp. Every other day we went to the excavation sites. Grandpa supervised the works while some of the junior staff members entertained me with their recent discoveries, under a strict condition that I'm not allowed to touch anything. There were ancient tools, household items, and even some remnants of traditional clothing. In the evenings, we would sit around the campfire and tell stories. I was having a good time. But something strange happened on day five or six. Me and my grandpa and most of the crew went to the mound that day, and two people stayed to look after the camp. When we came back, they had told us about the incident. They were on the side of the camp and nearest to the forest when they heard the sound of breaking glass. They had rushed to the other side to see what had happened, and soon enough, they noticed that a few houses had broken windows, all on the side that was facing the field. This scared the hell out of me. I seriously believed that the dead were disturbed by the excavations and they were warning us. Grandpa reassured me that cheap glass probably collapsed because of the hot weather. Contrary to popular belief, summers in Siberia can actually be pretty hot. And this particular summer was unusually hot. Just in case these were some hooligans or wild animals, Stefan suggested to have more people look after the camp. This never happened again, and I almost forgot about it. The real incident happened four days before I left. It was bright and extremely hot on windless day. Grandpa had finished his work on the excavations early, and we were rushing to the camp to be on time for lunch. I said, I'll see you there, to the other staff members. I took my backpack, and we headed to the camp. Five minutes later, we heard one of these staff members calling my grandpa out loud. He said, Probably something important. Go to the camp and I'll catch up. And he headed back to the excavations. It was 20 minutes later right when I was right in the middle of the field, when I felt something strange. It was like a wind, but not quite. It's hard to explain, but it felt like a moving field of static electricity. The weeds in the field didn't move and it was a dead silent. But I felt an invisible wave move and touch me. And then I got the feeling that I will never forget. Out of nowhere, I suddenly clearly realized that I was dying. 
I couldn't breathe. Time froze. My heart was beating quickly. I tried to calm myself down and I said to myself, just relax. This is probably just a panic attack from being alone in this ominous setting. But it didn't help one bit. I knew that it was a lie. I'm dying. Just like that without any apparent reason. And no one will find me in these tall weeds. And then I saw her. First I saw a shining orb of light moving towards me from the other side of the field very rapidly. For some reason, I immediately understood. The moment that it reaches me, I would die. I tried to breathe, I tried to move, but I was paralyzed. When the orb got closer, I started to see a silhouette. It looked like a person, but it didn't walk. It didn't even fly. It kind of just teleported through space. It had moved really strange like a thunderbolt. I know this sounds weird, but I'm trying to describe it precisely. Five meters away from me, it stopped. It looked like a young woman, blonde and very pale. She was naked and held a sickle in her hand. She was so beautiful. She was painful to look at. I even thought, now I'm ready to die. I will never see anything as beautiful. She didn't look angry or hostile. More like curious, but there was something off about her. In a moment, I realized that she didn't have any pupils. Her eyes were just all white. It was a strange feeling. I was scared. I didn't want to die. She was an obviously evil creature, but the very idea that she would go away plunged me into despair. The next thing I remember is that I heard some noise, some regular earthly noise, perhaps from moving weeds. She turned her head in the direction of the noise and started to move there. I blacked out. I awoke with a very severe headache and my body felt like a staff toy. At first, I didn't understand where I was. I was still in the field, but now the sun was setting. I felt lost, like I had woke up from the most wonderful dream. And at the same time, I felt relief from getting away from a certain death. I didn't know what to do, but I wanted to shake this feeling off and I wanted to be around people. And so I forced myself to get up. I saw a dark silhouette in the distance and thought that it was probably my grandpa searching for me. I was too exhausted to fear anything anymore, so I headed in that direction. And it was my grandpa. I called him, but he didn't respond or move. He was doing something strange. It looked like he was dancing and moving like having a stroke. His whole body was shaking, and he kept mumbling something inaudible. As I approached him, I started to discern something above his head. It was like a swirling cloud of concentrated darkness, some black mist, floating two meters above my grandpa's head. And then I heard noises of the approaching crowd and saw some flashlights in the distance. The cloud melted and disappeared, and Grandpa fell to the ground. It was a group from the camp, and they were very worried. They had picked up my Grandpa and rushed back to the camp. They talked about how hard it would be to get an ambulance out here. A nurse in our camp had examined Grandpa and concluded that it was sunstroke. For some reason, I didn't tell them anything about what I had seen. It might sound odd, but I didn't want anyone to know about the lady in the field. Luckily, Grandpa regained consciousness a few hours later. He looked very confused, he didn't recognize people, and he couldn't explain what had happened. He fully recovered by the next morning, but he had changed. Most of the time, he was as fun and kind as usual, but from time to time, he kind of froze and just looked into the void for a few minutes. When I tried to ask him if something was wrong, he didn't respond. He just gave me a very grim look. It was nothing like him. He honestly looked as though he could kill me. It was dreadful. And then he would just go back to normal. He would make jokes and tell funny stories. One time I asked him carefully if he remembered what happened to the field. He got very annoyed and said that, I'm a grown-up now, 
I shouldn't be afraid of some supernatural BIs. We both just had a sunstroke in the field and that's it. I never asked him about it again. Then two days I departed. Grandpa gave me a hug and wished me luck in school and said that he would see me on winter holiday. I was happy to see you, Pioneer, he said. He didn't come for winter holidays. As my father told me, he just doesn't feel like being around people right now. I'm recalling the words of my grandpa now. Our perception of reality is so acute. It would be insufferable for us to cope with all the bad things that can happen, if not for our ability to come up with explanations. I wondered if I as a kid made up this story to help me cope with Grandpa's sudden change and quick death. Or maybe it's the opposite, and I'm trying to pretend that he died of natural causes, and I never saw what I saw. I changed too. Not as much as my grandpa, but something is wrong with me. Sometimes I feel like I can't experience happiness and beauty the way that other people do. I just wish that I could see her again. For a brief moment. The following summer was the first time that I had mixed feelings about visiting grandpa. I was even going to tell my parents that I would rather go to a summer camp with my friends this year. But I didn't have to do it. In June, Grandpa died. He decided to take a midday nap and had a cardiac attack. When I was 16, my father told me that there was in fact a criminal investigation of his death due to suspicious circumstances. A few windows of his house were broken, as though someone had broken. I'm in the Navy and sailors are going missing. My command is covering it up. Written by Casey Were Alien. If the title didn't explain it well enough, I'm going to give it a try here. I'm currently a seaman at a training command. For the sake of security, I won't reveal which, but it is a fairly large and well-known command. I've been here for a few months, waiting for classes to start. FYI, never listen to your recruiters. They don't have an idea when you will graduate or go to the fleet. They told me that I would be in and out of training so fast that I wouldn't even have time to unpack. I got here on Halloween, and it's now close to New Year's. Anyway, that's not why I'm writing this. There is something here, and not some whack job of military experiment. Something much older than that. Something terrifying. When you are in between classes and training, you live your life assigned to a duty section and a permanent watch. Basically meaning, you have assigned days and times that you work, either cleaning or walking around the base and making sure no marines got their heads stuck in the toilet and that the airmen have working air conditioning. My permanent watch is Mids Rover, meaning that I get to walk my happy butt around base in the middle of the night with a partner, or I get to walk around the barracks, making sure that the fire extinguisher that gets checked every hour hasn't expired or discharged suddenly. This is called a fire watch. I first saw it when I was on a very dull fire watch. I had just checked the second floor's extinguisher and emergency exit for the fifth time that night. When I heard scratching, I looked up from my clipboard, thinking someone got shitty down at the base club and forgot that we had a front door. What I saw was not the drunken sailor I expected, but what looked like a hand. 
in the light from the escape. I could see that it was long and thin, almost a mossy green color with short broken yellow fingernails. I'm watching, sure that our barracks is currently filling with carbon monoxide or some gas that could make me hallucinate. When the door violently starts rattling, so like the stupid junior sailor I am, I run towards the door, cause my unarmed clipboard carrying butt is going to be able to do a dang thing, right? A few steps from the door, I stopped, blood running colder than Neptune's nipples at a blue nose ceremony. This thing, whatever the heck this thing is or was, is tall. Not just like, wow, I'm short so everyone seems tall, but tall enough it had to bend down to look into the small window on the fire escape door. It is grin and wildly thin. Not just that, but its eyes glowed almost like two flashlights. When it saw me, it screamed the most ear-shattering scream I have ever heard. Its teeth were jagged and yellow, and it had two flaring slits for its nose. As I dropped my clipboard and fell to the floor, I could hear footsteps. And that's the last thing I remember. When I came to, I was in Senior Chief's office with him and our lieutenant staring at me. Outside the office, it sounded like the whole night crew was shuffling around, trying to pretend that they were busy. After a series of rapid fire questions and explaining what I saw, the lieutenant starts swearing like, well, a sailor, and left the room quickly to make some phone calls. The senior chief had calmly explained that all the rovers had been recalled to the barracks, which never happens, ever. It's a major security issue, even if checking fire extinguishers and breaking up fights between marines and raccoons is boring. He also very sternly told me that I had seen nothing, that there was a no gas leak, and that I was to report to medical in the morning because very clearly I was sick, running a fever, and hallucinating. I was swiftly dismissed from his office and told to go to bed. But as I was leaving, I caught him watching the security footage on his computer. You could see two lights coming from the door's window and me dropping to the ground. Walking out of his office, I was suddenly bombarded by the night crew, asking what had happened and why they were recalled. And I told them honestly, I have no freaking clue. The next morning, after waiting several hours at sick call, I was given a clean bill of health. There was absolutely nothing wrong with me. No signs of illness, disease, or defect. Which doesn't always mean much coming from Navy Medical. But at that point, I would take anything I could get. After returning to a senior's office with my handy-dandy paperwork... I was once again sat down and told nothing had happened. I was also being put on the external night rover team, meaning that I would have a partner and would be checking the outdoor areas of the base. Freaking fantastic, right? You see some sort of tall green demon dude and I get to be stuck outside all night with it a radio, a flashlight, and a maybe competent partner who wanted to do more than hang out at the female barracks smoke pit. That was about a week ago. 
I was just starting to forget about the demonic green bean and starting to feel comfortable in my new watch when everything changed. I woke up this afternoon to my roommate in a full panic. One of the new seamen recruits, fresh out of boot camp, had gone missing at some point between when I got off watch at 6am and when my roommate got out of the class at 2pm. The poor kid probably didn't even get to wash the smell of fear and lever 2000 out of his clothing before he went missing. The base was preparing searches off the beaches and doubling down on security and rovers. When I assumed my watch, we were given strict instructions to stay in pairs and radio in anything that we found. If we found anything related to the missing sailor, we were to not touch anything and call it in immediately while keeping everyone else away from what we had found. How would we know what was related to the missing sailor? I had no idea. But this is the military, where logic doesn't matter and instructions aren't given to make sense. Our watch started off fairly normal. With double the personnel, it was much easier to cover ground and to not feel so alone. It sounds lame, but one of the largest bases in the country is creepy as hell naturally when there's only two people walking around outside. My partner and I took the path to the beach training area while the other team started with the parking lots and classrooms. As we were walking to the beach, I hear this absolutely miserable, ear-raking screech. And my partner did too, because they covered their ears as fast as I did. Our radios started screaming static, and we looked at each other, deciding what our next step would be. We could go forward and investigate, and find something we didn't want to, or potentially break up some super secret spy plot. My partner was absolutely convinced someone was jamming our radios, and we would be heroes if we could corner them. Not that anyone with that equipment would be unharmed, or would think twice about picking off two junior sailors. We could turn around at least until our radios were working, and we could call for backup. But my partner was convinced these expert spies he dreamed up would get away. Or we could split up. One of us go forward to investigate, and one back to get help. The exact thing we were told not to do. So what do we do? We go forward. Because my partner is an absolute idiot. And I ain't about to get no captain's mast because his dumbass won't go back. The screeching gets louder and louder. And we have to shut our radios off because the static is so overwhelming. My partner is so caught up in the idea that he's going to get a letter of recommendation that he didn't notice the droplets of blood in the sand. He also didn't notice the missing sailor's name tag being licked by the low tide. We were nearing the piers when I saw the lights. I guess that I should probably just call them eyes at this point. My heart sank. I knew. I knew what I saw was real. And my partner was about to see it too. Or he would have. If the thing hadn't launched out from under the pier at him. It was like watching one of those trapdoor spiders attack. My partner had no clue what had happened. And I can only hope that his death was swift. 
I watched as the thing flew at him at an inhuman speed. I heard his bones shatter on impact, and I heard it howl in delight as it ripped the skin from his face. I ran, running blindly as fast as I could. I didn't even feel the pavement between my boots, or stop running till I ran face first into the other rovers. Sobbing, I grabbed the radio and told Senior that it was bad. It was back, and he needed to get down here. Immediately, we were all recalled, and once again, I was in the office, this time surrounded by officers that I had never met. They assured me that they had a rescue team down in the area, and that once again, I was hallucinating, and I had managed to abandon my roving partner. That didn't last long, though. One of the officers, a rear admiral, I think, got a phone call. He quickly turned as pale as I felt and told Senior to mark the two missing sailors as AWOL. He wanted me detained and everyone to regroup at the main quarter deck. I've been locked in this office for two hours. I don't know what's going to happen to me. And I don't know what happened to the other two sailors. But I do know a couple of things. One being, your recruiter lied. Given how all these senior enlisted and officers have acted, they knew something was going on. And they covered it up. I think anyone who has been in long enough knows the dangers aren't sunken ships or unsung battles, but the things that lurk by the water. Second, I know that I'm not getting out of this mess. I didn't ask to be in, and so I'm writing this down here. I was lucky that I kept my phone hidden in my cargo pocket. I don't know if the other branches have this problem, but no, if you hear about a sailor going AWOL, it probably isn't what it seems. I hear them coming back now, and I hope I get the opportunity to update this later. But if I don't, just know that there are things out there we don't understand that are older than us, and the government and the military know about them. I work in a restaurant for cannibals. I'm the only human employee. Written by Darkly Gathers. Can I take your order, sir? I asked the patron. Notepad in one hand, pen in the other, held steady. The creature looks me over. One of his eyes remains fixed in the menu before him. The other rolls with a wet squelch, rotating independently and hungrily, giving me the once over. I'm used to it. Such is the duty of a human that works in a restaurant that serves primarily human flesh. The man licks his lips with a dark tongue, though of course he isn't a man, not really. Settled into a seat amongst peers and like-minded creatures, he can afford to relax a little. The colors of his suit start to fade, and it becomes disturbingly clear that he isn't wearing a suit at all. He has simply altered the colors and shades of his own crustily scaled skin, like a chameleon. His eyes have begun to bulge from their sockets, yellowing as they grow, pupils expanding and contracting. He grins, revealing the multiple layers of gray-green teeth behind his cracked lips, and a slippery black tongue, easily the length of my forearm, burst from his mouth and licks the side of his face with a disgusting and grotesque lack of shame. He is like many of the others, the ones I refer to privately as the cannibals. Though I suppose they technically aren't cannibals in the literal sense, as a cannibal is a human that eats another human, 
And these guys aren't human. If they ever were, they're certainly not anymore. But the patrons aren't even the worst part. As I said, I'm used to it. What I'm not used to, what I am yet to become comfortable with, even after a year of employment, and what I doubt I'll ever get used to, is the smell. The smell you see, it's just, well, it's delicious. It's absolutely divine. Warm and steamy, like roasted pork. It makes one salivate. It only took a week or two of working here to turn myself into a fully-fledged vegetarian. But I still have to ensure that I come to work with a full stomach before my shifts. Or it will, without fail, start to rumble. The air just smells so good. And it sickens me. I am deeply disturbed by how tasty the smell of freshly cooked human flesh really is. I hate it. But there is nothing I can do. I've tried and tried to get out of my contract, but there is simply no way out. Twelve months ago, I fell victim to a series of unlikely and unfortunate events. Events that saw me bound to this terrible restaurant. Bound by the contract. I am forced to uphold it utterly and totally. And the owner refuses to release me. And even if she did, what then? Would she carve me up and serve me to the guests? I like to think that she wouldn't. I would hope that she really does see me as a colleague of sorts, and that we could part ways good-naturedly. That she would allow me to just leave. But I'm not so sure. And that frightens me. The uncertainty. I hope you don't think that I'm a monster, by the way. For referring to the freaks that run this sickening place as colleagues. But I've learned a few things in life. You gotta look out for number one, because no one else will. As much as this restaurant horrifies and disgusts me, I have to look after my own best interests, and that includes keeping my colleagues on side, keeping my head down, and doing my bloody work. I come in when the rota demands, and one day my contract will end, and I hopefully will be let free. And if not, well... I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Get a move on, Godfrey. Warbles his female companion from across the table with a little belch. I'm starving here. She groans and I shoot her a glance at her stomach. Distended and still shaded pale pink from her dress. Visibly rumbles and shakes. One of the male's eyes had been fixed on me this entire time. But his second now joins it flicking up to stare at me, and only me. I do not flinch, and I try to keep my grim as subtle as I politely await his order. What would you recommend, waiter? The thing asked me, his tongue lolling from side to side as he does so. I smile pleasantly, though it does not reach my eyes. The steak is very good, sir, though they do tend to go a little heavy on the juices. I would suggest asking for only a light drizzle. Hmm, splendid, he mutters, his lips peeling back to reveal all four layers of broken teeth. I'll have that then, please. Rare. And for you, madam, I ask, turning to his companion, trying not to look at the monster on the table behind her tearing into his meal like a rabid dog, blood and spittle flying like thick rain and spraying out over the tablecloth. She grunts and scratches her chin with a four-fingered hand. One eye reads the menu as her other rolls, giddily staring around the room. It leaks a little with pus and her tongue shoots out to lick it clean, before retracting messily behind her teeth. I clench my jaw. I'll have the blade loin and a side of ribs. I write down her order. These small ribs, please, she mutters her lips crackling and peeling back into a grin. Certainly, madam. I reply, stone-faced. I'll get these orders to the chefs and I'll bring it all out as soon as it's ready. I hope you enjoy your evening. I turn and head to the kitchen. I can feel their eyes bore hungrily into my back as I take my leave. 
would these freaks try to eat me if it weren't for the owner? Try to tear me limb from limb between the tables. I'm sure that a great many of them probably would. It's an unsettling feeling, to say the least, but the owners keep the patrons in line. I'm not sure if it's so much of a humanitarian solidarity, but rather more like a practical, employee maintenance initiative. They do struggle for staff here. I stake my way through the maze of tables, avoiding the greedy, roaming eyes of the guests and pretending that I don't feel and or care about their skin-crawling little caresses as I pass them by. I don't know if they think that they're being subtle, or if they simply don't care, but it disgusts me. I can bring issues to the owner and she'll probably kick the offender out right then and there, provided they aren't too high profile. But it happens so much that it's not worth mentioning. What's the point? Just keep your head down, don't cause a fuss and do your work. The ripe and heavy smells of cooking flash redouble as I push through the doors into the kitchen. I feel the sweat start to pinprick across my skin at once. One of the waitresses passes me by and back out through the doors, carrying two plates of steaming pink-red meat in her hands. She shoots me a glance with all three of her amber-tinted eyes, but doesn't smile. They're civil to me, the other waiters and waitresses. Civil, but not kind. I don't really give a crap, to be honest. I have no interest in being their friend. No need to become too prominent on anyone's radar. Just as long as they respect me enough to not cause or seek out any issues. These chefs, however, are outright hostile. Order up, I say in a loud but dispassionate voice, holding out the order slip. The nearest chef reaches around the counter and snatches it in a gnarled hand, grunting and squinting and leaking from his pores as he reads through. I can't freaking read a word of this. Weren't you never taught to write, boy? Blade loin, a side of small ribs and a steak, rare, light drizzle. Light drizzle, the chef barks, looking up at me. Pupils are narrowing rapidly. He slams the severed, bloody arm he's holding down onto the counter with a splat and leans across to look at me. I suppress a gag. You've been making these crap suggestions to the customers again, meatbag. The drizzle's the best part. I'm just telling you what they ordered, Bert. I reply levelly, holding his gaze. And you know what? He's got good taste. There is always too much drizzle. You prick, Bert shouts at me, but stuffs the order into the slot and grabs the arm, muttering and swearing to himself and the others as he turns back to the stoves. The best tactic when it comes to these chefs is to just not take anything, I found. My talk back might irritate them, but weakness is worse. They despise it. The kid's right, you know, Bert, comes a gruff voice from the other side of the kitchen. A taller chef, round-bellied and gray-scaled, bald and jowled. You risk ruining another good dish with your obsession with that frickin' sauce. Oh, shut it, Grummy, Bert replies. Just cause you're older, don't make you any wiser, you dummy. Grummy snorts with laughter as he flips the contents of his pan. It looks like a series of dried and crusted human ears, but I can't be sure. He winks at me and points to the bloodied plate on the side. That one's ready to go out, John. Table 12. All right, cheers, Grummy. I grab the plate, wincing with the heat but holding it steady nonetheless. Try not to focus too carefully on the actual food, reading the note instead for details of the meal's contents. Grummy's the only one in the kitchen who's actually decent to me. I'm not sure why. The cynic in me half believes that he's trying to groom me, Biding his time for the perfect opportunity to cut me down and carve me up. But then again, perhaps not. I vouched for him once at an important juncture when one of the other chefs kept screwing up the orders. Back in my first month of employment, I was witness to a great deal of kitchen chaos and inter-staff fighting. The head chef at the time was losing his wits and pinning all the blame for his messed up orders on Grummy. And everyone believed him too wrapped up in their own stuff to see what was going on for themselves. They just put their misguided faith in the authority. 
but I saw. I always see. I see things that others don't, even with those roaming eyes of theirs. And so I vouched for him, for Grummy. I tried to keep it on the down low and only told the owner, but one thing led to the next and the head chef was quickly fired. Grummy won back his respect and he recently earned the title of head chef himself. Information, regardless of its source, has a tendency to leak through the cracks and trickle down. And Grummy became much nicer to me after that. I suspect that he found out where his support came from, one way or another. I carried the order out to table 12. A waiter calls a woman from one of the tables to my left. I shoot her a glance as I pass her by. Her jaw protrudes out to the sides at awkward angles and cracks as she speaks. Red goo leaks from her lips. We need some extra sides over here. I'll be right with you, madam. Apologies. Yes, I think to myself. My apologies for doing my job, you disgusting creature. I approach table 12. A man with fly-like eyes and a mouth bordered by scorpion fangs rubs all four of his hands together excitedly. The mashed liver, sir. I announce as I place the plate down in front of him. Is there anything else I can? But before I'm able to finish, the man has shoved his face into the food. I pull back as he gnaws and tears at it with feverish desperation, spraying the contents across the table and up and over my uniform. It splatters up to my chest. I am beset by a powerful waft of the food and my complexion pales. The man turns to me. His eyes quiver and a low buzzing rumbles in his throat. He stops eating, grunting as he does so, staring right at me, poised and tensed. And I find myself suddenly very afraid. I want to take a step back. I want to run the heck away. But I am overcome with a terror that, to do so, risks shattering the thin ice upon which this moment rests. My gut tells me that something is wrong. Something is about to happen. Images of the monster lunging right at me, springing from his chair and burying his fangs into my throat and tearing it open like wet tissue paper, race like fire through my head. Is this it? Is this how it ends? No build-up, no ceremony. Just one rabid customer too many. One customer who couldn't control his urges. Despite the power of the threats laid down by the owner. The clear warnings on the signs. Is this it? There's a tray on a nearby table. One in the process of being cleared away. Maybe I should grab the tray. Use it as a kind of makeshift shield. But the moment passes. The tension breaks. I stumble back in alarm. Instead of attacking me, however, the creature doubles over. He stands, clutching at his neck. He screeches, a noise which is quickly cut off by a gurgling and a spluttering in his throat. I stare at him for a second or two in confusion. Some of the other nearby patrons have turned to look as well. The man's distress grows. He grabs me by the collar and then releases me almost instantly. He slams his many fists down against the table. He knocks over his chair and stumbles into the next table over. Everyone is looking now, staring at the commotion. And I realize, is he choking? After another second or two, I think that perhaps he is. What would you do in this situation, I wonder? I weigh my options. Everyone's gaze is focused on the creature but it'll become apparent quite quickly who the closest employee was at the time of the incident. It's possible that there are staff eyes on me right now. Don't make a big deal of it, John, but do what needs to be done. Right. I quickly step behind the monstrous man. I grab a hold of the cuff of his shirt to stop him from flailing, though it becomes immediately clear that I have grabbed nothing but a roll of a scaled flesh and start slamming the heel of my hand in between his shoulder blades. What the devil are you doing? Shouts a man from the next table. Saving his life, sir. I reply back through grunts, as I bring my hand down hard for the fifth time. Still, the creature chokes, his chest rising and falling rapidly as he wheezes. 
Very well. Here goes nothing. I think to myself as I step forward and reach both arms around him. Time to find out if the Heimlich Maneuver works on these things. I ball up one of my fists against the place that I presume is solar plexus to be. And I bring the palm of my other hand down and onto it, hard with the force of a punch. And a chunk of red-purple meat flies from the creature's mouth. I actually see it soar through the air and splatter against a bottle of wine a few tables down. The man staggers and wheezes, filling his lungs with great bouts of air. It's difficult to gauge expression on that monstrous face of his. But he turns to me and, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that he looked rather bewildered, to be frank. You, you saved me, he sputters, but I just lead him back to a seat, ignoring the round of applause that now rolls across the restaurant floor. A bizarre situation indeed. I just make sure that he is alright and, still reeling from the palpitations caused by my first suspicion, make a hasty escape to the storeroom as professionally as I can, avoiding eye contact with all as I do so. I wonder as I walk whether or not I had acted correctly, whether my moves were wise, whether the creature was worth saving. You didn't do it for him. You did it for you. It was easier to do something than to do nothing. But even now, even after saving one of their own, I still feel their hungry glances. I still shiver at their clammy touches, this time under the guise of congratulations. I still see them lick their lips and sweat as I pass them by. I despise them. John. I have rounded the corner and left the main lobby of the restaurant. The storeroom sits at the end of the corridor, and at the opposite end is the room that Helia uses as her office. That's her name, the owner, Helia. I look up at the sound of her voice. I saw what you did there, John. Don't think I didn't see. For some reason, the first emotion that passes through me is fear, but I try to force it down. Why should I be afraid? I didn't do anything wrong, did I? It's fascinating how even the mere tone of an authority figure can make you doubt yourself. Yes, I reply as coolly as possible, doing my best to maintain a neutral expression. Yes. She repeats, chuckling, her chins wobbling as she does so. You saved our customer's life. You're a hero. I work in a restaurant that serves my fellow man up on a platter. I'm not a hero. I'm a traitor. Thanks, I reply. Here, take these. And go fetch me another leg from the freezer and then get yourself home. My heart leaves. Could it be? She wouldn't, would she? Is she going to release me from my contract? Take the rest of the day off. You've earned it. We can manage here for tonight, she says. My pulse slows back down. The rest of the day. Right, of course. I nod. Uh, thank you, Helia. And I reach out a hand to catch the keys as she tosses them to me. And then she turns and retreats back into her office. I look down at my hand. The keys. She's never trusted me with the keys before. Could this be some kind of test? These will allow me access to the freezers. I've never been down there. It's usually one of these chefs that go down, or on a rare occasion, one of the other waiters or waitresses. But never me. Never the human. I never settled on a reason as to why. And to be honest, I never really cared. I was grateful for not having to travel down to the freezers. The place the meat is held and kept cool and fresh. Grateful for the privilege of keeping the rooms out of sight and out of mind. But now... Now it seems I am going to go down after all. And the meaning behind her request suddenly registers. Go fetch me another leg from the freezer. Another leg... My stomach turns at the thought. Seeing the food is one thing. The fleeting glimpses of these shops' preparation techniques is another. But to actually locate and carry the parts up to the kitchen myself. 
does she see this as a reward? As an increase of responsibility? Or is this some kind of sick joke? I don't know how these things work. I really don't. But I want to get out of here and go home. If only for the night. Do your job, John. and Keep your colleagues on side. And go home. And so I grip my teeth. I steal my stomach and I head off through the corridors. Through the locked door at the back of the restaurant and down the stairs into the bluish, frosty gloom. My breath clouding by my mouth. I shiver as I descend. Down into the dark. I step heavily onto the floor and start to stroll through the length of this new corridor. A leg. The kitchen needs a leg. I push through the nearest door and come to a sudden stop. And I realize that I shouldn't have come down here. I should have refused her offer. I should have taken the keys back to her office. I should have passed the buck to somebody else. All these thoughts and more flood to the forefront as I stare in horror at the pieces of humans that are hooked and packaged around the room. Arms, legs, chunks of unidentifiable flesh, a torso hooked and stripped of limbs, a bucket of hands that sits on the ground to my immediate right, and in the corner, in the corner are a pile of heads. I don't need to look directly at them, I can tell, I can see. I can see their wide and staring eyes, lifeless and empty. I stagger back and out of the room, stumbling and tripping down to the ground with a loud thud. Jesus Christ, I shout. Uh, screw this terrible place. I sit myself up against the wall, running my hands through my hair as the sweat freezes against my back, collecting my breath. I'll go back up. I'll pass the keys to another employee. Tell them that Helia herself had requested that they retrieve the leg, because I'm sure as heck not doing it. I'm not spending another unnecessary second in this nightmare basement. I may be bound to employment, but Helia can't force me to come down here. She can't. She can't. My thoughts are interrupted by a voice, soft and weak from a little further down the corridor. Hello? I turn and stare, heart pounding once again. Hello? It comes for a second time. It's high-pitched. It sounds like... It sounds like the voice of a little girl. Please, she whimpers. Is anyone there? Oh, God. There's someone down here. Someone else. Someone alive. I scramble to my feet and stare down the corridor to the source of the voice. My breath steams in the cold and blue-tinged air. It could just be a prank, John. A fellow employee playing a sick joke. Or something worse. A test. A trap. I shoot a glance behind, back to the stairs that lead up and out into the restaurant. Remember, John, you've got to look out for a number one. Self-preservation is key. Don't put yourself at risk. My primary thought process is interrupted by another. What? You're not even going to look. You can afford to take a look, John. There's time. Go and see. I shiver and run a hand through my hair. I could go and look. There's nothing wrong with that. And so I creep down the corridor and deeper into the gloom. Passing by more heavy doors, some with circular little glass windows built into them. I don't look directly through, but in the corner of my eye, I see more than enough of the twisted and sickening horrors that lie beyond. The stuck and hooked slabs of meat, hanging limbs, and worse. Ugh. I round a corner at the corridor's far end. It turns off at a right angle and goes on for another couple of meters, and then comes to an abrupt stop. There are a few more doors around there, all sealed tight. I stay still for a moment, head cocked, heart pounding, and listen. A part of me, a cowardly part, hopes that I don't hear anything else, that there is nothing to be done here. I can just head back up to the restaurant relatively guilt-free, and go the hell home. 
but that is not what happens. Please, comes the voice, weaker this time, but quite clear, quite clear enough, even muffled behind the door as it is. I step closer and try to look through the circular pane, but the glass has frosted, and I see nothing but blurry shapes and the room beyond. I try the handle, locked tight. A ticking hand in my watch seems disproportionately loud. I lean back around the corner and I shoot another glance up to the stairs. This goes against every instinct of self-preservation I have, but I can't help it. I'm only human. I start cycling through the keys in the ring, trying each one in the icy lock. The first one fails, as does the second. Footsteps creak above me as someone makes their way across the ground floor. Key number three. Let's try it. My hand shakes as I bring it to the lock. Fumbling as I try to fit the key inside, succeeding. I successfully turn it around in an arc. The door rocks with a loud clunk, and I grab the handle, hauling it open. An icy cloud billows out and I curse as it washes over my exposed skin. It takes a second to disperse, and when it does, I see her. She can't be more than seven or eight, knees drawn up to her chest, arms wrapped tight around her shoulders. She sits there, shivering violently in the corner of the room. Lines have been drawn in marker at various intervals across her body, around her arms, her sides, her legs. She stares up at me with wide and frightened eyes, and I stare back. To her right, all across these shelves are carved up pieces of a human body, encased in tight, translucent plastic wrapping, scarlet stained. We remain fixed in place for a moment, her and I. Get out, John, screams the voice inside my head. She's the only living thing down here. She's being saved for a special occasion, and they will notice if she is missing. Leave her here. I reach behind my back and untie the deep red canvas apron that forms the key piece of my uniform. I crouch down and I wrap it around her. At the slightest gesture of concern, she breaks and rushes forward, clinging tight to my arm and shuddering, crying silent tears that stream down her face. They'll replace her with you. How can you possibly think you can save her, John? My sense of rationality screams at me as I hurriedly lead her down the corridor and back towards the stairs. What can you possibly do? There's no way you can get her out of here unscathed. There is just no way. You have to look out for number one. This will be your undoing. It's okay. I mutter to the girl. It's okay. I'm going to get you out. You hear me? I'm going to get you out of here. But you have to do exactly as I say, okay? No response. I stop halfway up the stairs and squat down, grabbing her tight by these shoulders and looking into her eyes. Okay. She nods quickly, tears still flowing in silent rivers. Right, okay. We can do this. We can do this. I take a deep breath as I grab a hold of the freezer door's heavy handle. The walnut will return us into the back of the restaurant. Locked. No. Oh, no. Crap! I blurt out releasing the girl's hand and using both to pull on the handle. She clings instead to my leg. No, 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 no. So it was a trap then. It was a trap all along. This is it. This is the end. Unless... Unless it's just the cold, I think out loud. Is it frozen? I shoot the girl a glance and she doesn't reply. I grunt and grip tightly on the handle. Veins bulging in my forearms as I pull it down. And with a crack and a little burst of frost, the door swings open. Relief floods through me. It'll be short-lived, but for now, it's most welcome. I peer out and I look both ways. Empty. I encourage the girl to follow and she does so. 
Uh, I lock the freezer door tight behind us and I think through my admittedly limited options as quickly as I can. There are two ways out of this place. The fire exit at the back and the main door is at the front. None of the windows will open wide enough to get her out. And the fire exit might be alarmed and to get to it, you have to pass through the kitchen. My swallow. Main entrance it is. I look down at the girl. She looks back up at me as she fumbles with these straps of the apron, wrapped it tightly around herself. She's so small. Could I hide her in something? I rack my brains. There are boxes in the storeroom that are used for cutting off trash. She'd probably fit in one of those. But they'll notice she's missing. They'll know it was you, John. Uh, unless... Right, follow me. Come on, trust me. Everything's going to be okay. My voice shakes as I speak. I imagine that she can hear the fear, but she follows nonetheless. We dart back through the corridors, and the sounds and smells of the main restaurant grow stronger and closer. The final stretch of corridor is a short one, and once we enter into it, we will be caught in a direct line sight with many of the closest tables. I peer around the edge. To the left, at the far end, I see patrons held in the thralls of their meals, grunting and stuffing their faces with the kitchen's finest works, distending their jaws and growling, perhaps unconsciously, as they tear the chunks of steamy flesh right off the bone. Ahead and just off to the right is the door to the immense bathroom. Stay here, I whisper to the girl. She looks like she's about to panic. I'll be right back. Just give me a few seconds, I promise. She anxiously releases her grip. And with one more glance, I stroll as nonchalantly as I can across the corridor and push through the door to the bathroom. A quick look around confirms that it is empty and I return at once to the girl. I take her hand. Stay on this side of me. Keep pace. Don't make a sound, okay? She nods. I glance once again around the corner. No one has noticed and no one is coming. Spittle and saliva flies from the cracked and peeled lips of the closest patron. But she isn't looking this way. She's sitting at an angle. I steal myself. Here we go. Three... Two, one, now. We stride as one across the corridor. She has to walk a little quicker to keep up, and I hear her ragged breaths alongside me. To my ears, they sound dangerously loud. I reach out for the bathroom door, eyes ahead, and I push through. I breathe. I take her to the cubicle furthest from the door, and I draw her inside. You need to stay here, okay? Hide up in here on the toilet. Keep your feet up and stay totally silent. I will come back for you, I promise. I won't be long. Just don't move, okay? She looks scared at the prospect of being left here alone. She shakes her head. I bring my face closer to hers. I hiss with greater desperation now. They are going to hurt you. You know this, don't you? Unless I can get you out of here, they're going to hurt you a lot. So please, please, stay here, stay silent, and I'll be back, I promise. The girl says nothing, but tentatively she releases her grip and huddles herself up on top of the toilet. I'll be back. Lock the door, okay? Don't open it for anyone but me. And with that, I depart. I hurry back to the bathroom door, pausing to ensure that the girl does as I asked. I see her feet below the stall door. I hear the lock click, and I see her feet disappear again. She'll be okay. I return into the restaurant, pulse racing. All right, John, next steps. You're committed now. Don't screw this up. I stride down the edge of the restaurant, trying to keep in the shadows, but still unavoidably catching the attention of the more shameless of the customers. I see them drag those disgusting gray-black tongues across their blood-stained mouth. I see their rolling eyes following my movements. I feel their vile and sticky caresses against my elbows as I push into one of these side rooms. The higher-class diners tend to eat in here. It's less noisy. I see one of my fellow employees, 
the waitress from earlier. All three eyes are fixed on a customer as she takes his order. I bide my time, waiting. And when she's done, I alter my course and intercept her before she can return to the kitchen. A uh, Garen, hey. She looks up at me. I take her scaled wrist in my hand and push the keys into them before she has a chance to question me or refuse. She grimaces. One eye looks down at her hand and the other two remain fixed on me. I don't think that we've ever made intentional physical contact before. Her skin around the arms is rough and it's not quite scaled, but still harder than it should be. Why are your hands so cold? She asks. Humans are warm-blooded, aren't they not? I pause. Just been outside. A smoke break. Since when do you smoke? Just started. It's stressful working here. For obvious reasons. Why are you giving me these, John? She asks. Mahalia wants you down in the freezer. The kitchen needs an arm. Uh, why don't you go down? I shrug. I'm human, ain't I? I've never been down there before. I don't know where anything is. She rolls all three of her eyes. Fine, take this to the kitchen for me then. She pauses. And where's your apron? I take the order slip from her free hand. My ship's over for the day. I'm on my way home. Thanks. I turn in straight away before she can ask me any more questions. I realize that my fist had been clenched against the side of my leg and stretched my fingers encouraging the blood flow. Back through the restaurant, the tension is palpable. I feel it like a tangible field, one that could shatter at any moment. Stay calm, John. Stay calm. I push past the doors and into the uncomfortable warmth of the kitchen. Mortar up. I say above the sizzle of the cookers and hold the slip across the counter. Bert reaches out and snatches it with an angry mutter. Freaking meat bag. I can't read a single word of this stuff. I'm already backing away, returning to the doors. Bert, I didn't even write that one. I don't know what it says. He stared at me incredulously, snarling. He bears his row of gray-green teeth and spits onto the counter. You what, boy? What are you doing swapping orders for? You trying to make my life as difficult as possible, you dumb sack of flesh. Some of the other chefs have glanced over. They paused their jobs, knives and other such fearsome apparatus in their hands. The general bustle of the kitchen slows somewhat. I swallow. An unpleasant experience with my death-dry throat. I step back up to the counter. Look, just hand it over to me and let me see. Big mistake, he barks, shoving the now crumpled and sweat-stained note back into my hand. To the guy's credit, it is actually rather difficult to read. It's, uh, they want... They want the steak, medium rare, with the leg daubles on the side. Me grunts as he snatches the note back and stuffs it into the order slot. The others have returned to their duties. The bustle resumes, and I get the heck out. I'm just hoping and praying that I don't bump into Helia. My movements will be far harder to explain to her, and I can't leave the girl in the bathroom. She needs me. I head right across the restaurant, abandoning the shadowy edge for the more direct but less comfortable route through the tables to the corridor. That will lead me to the storeroom. Waiter, someone calls. Waiter. I ignore them. For all they know, I have other duties to attend to. In a sense, I do. In the stock room, I grab myself a new apron and hastily slip it over my neck and fasten it around my waist. I root through the piles of cardboard and pick up a large cardboard box still in one piece and one that I'm hoping will be strong enough to hold the weight of the girl inside without collapsing. It was a smart enough plan in my head, but now that I'm looking at it, can I really carry the girl in this box? What if she's just too heavy and breaks out through the bottom? I run my hands through my hair and look around the storeroom. There's nothing else in here that will be any use to me. I don't have much of a choice. The box it is. I grab the thing and empty it of the papers that are strewn about inside, carrying it back through the storeroom door. I can avoid going through the main restaurant now, and instead head through the accompanying side corridor in my return to the bathroom. I pass by these series of disturbing pictures to which I become accustomed to 
over my many long months in employment. A framed portrait of a disgusting monster, less humanoid than most. It could well be an old relative of Helia's. His eyes appear to follow my movements. An oil canvas painting, one that depicts a barren field beneath the blood red of an evening sky. A pile of corpses sits rotting in the background, ever so slightly out of immediate focus. A blown up black and white photograph of a similar restaurant's opening. At least, I have assumed it to be a different restaurant. It must be. The building is exactly the same, but I don't recognize the surrounding location. I join back up to the hallway with the bathrooms. I appreciate that I made it sound like there are a labyrinth of winding corridors and halls that adjoin this restaurant, but honestly, there aren't actually a great deal. The freezer was larger than I had expected it to be, admittedly, but it has the luxury of having an entire floor to itself. If I meet anyone coming the opposite way down one of these corridors, then I'll have to hold the box above my head to allow them to pass. Something that I doubt I'll be able to do even if I have the girl inside. I use my foot to push through into the men's bathroom. I come to a stop and suck some air through my teeth as I do so. All three stalls are occupied. A man with cracked horns and bulging, shadowed sacks beneath his eyes raps irritably on the door of the furthest stall. The one that hides the girl. Hello, is anyone in there? He grunts, crouching slightly to try and peer beneath the door. Sir, I stammer, trying to keep my voice as level as I can. That one's out of order, I'm afraid. You might just have to wait for one of the others to open up. He eyes me greedily, sucking a long strand of saliva back into his mouth. Hmm, <laughs> he mutters, but says no more and moves away, waiting by the second of the doors instead. There is an uncomfortable silence as we both stand still in the bathroom, not that far apart. Waiting. And then the toilet flushes and another of the cannibals pushes out from his stall. The man with the horns take his place, shutting the door behind him as its former occupant washes up and pushes past it out into the restaurant. Not before a quick stuff of my immediate air as he passes me by, however. I shiver in disgust and quietly step to the furthest stall. I kneel down and poke my head beneath the door, meeting the gaze of the little girl huddled and shaking and white with terror. Let me in, I mouth, and after a beat, she does so, tentatively stepping onto the ground and reaching for the lock as I pulled back, pushing through the door and quickly shutting it closed again behind me. You're going to have to get into the box, I whisper, setting it on the ground. There's not a great deal of space in here, so I shuffle to the side, back pressed up against the cubicle's wall. She stares at it, and then back at me, and I see for a moment the plan through her eyes. Yes, I know it's kind of stupid. This goes against every instinct I have. Well, not quite every instinct. My sense of humanity shines bright, but the others, the ones that have thus far kept me alive, are resentful and angry. I know, I whisper. But please, I need you to get out of here before they realize you're missing. So please, just get in. She stares at me. I can see the gears turning in her head. Her eyes are red and raw, but she has stopped crying. And she clambers carefully into the box. Stay quiet. Don't move. I'll get you out. I close the lid. I stretch my back. I turn behind me and unlock the door in preparation. Then, when I think the bathroom is clear... I squat down and grab the box, tilting it upwards, sliding both my hands beneath. Christ. The girl, of course, isn't very heavy, but the size and shape of the box means that a disproportionate amount of weight is being supported by my forearms. I grunt with a strain as I rise to a stand, adjusting the positions of my arms as best I can. I use my feet to open the door and stride back through the bathroom pushing into the corridor and returning the way that I came, through the hallway in the back. No risk to be sure, if I bump into anyone coming the opposite way, but safer than taking it through the actual main lobby of the restaurant. I won't be able to avoid it entirely, however. The corridor leads past the storeroom, 
and back into the main room. A little closer to the entrance, definitely, but still a fair distance away. Go, just go for it. Look ahead and get to the doors. And my heart pounds as I walk, awkwardly and at an angle so as to see around the box, but speedy enough, I hope. Muscle straining, step by step. Hey! Oh god, don't panic. I'm making my way down the edge of the restaurant, down the side around the far table. A little further ahead and that's it. The entrance doors. The escape. Hey, waiter. I see movement in the corner of my eye. A patron has risen to their feet at their table. I shoot over a glance and see that it is the man from before. With the scorpion fangs, the fly-like glitterball eyes, and the forearms. The one that I had saved from choking. He waves at me, using one of his hands to wipe the gore from his mouth, flicking the residue down under the tablecloth and over his empty plate. A part of me just wants to run, to make a break for it. It's not like anyone would stop me. But is the box sturdy enough, or would the girl fall through? And regardless, my behavior would be noticed, noticed and noted. And I'm on thin ice as it is. But a regular behavior plus a missing girl equals guilty. And I don't know what would happen to me if I'm judged as such. Game over, I guess. That's the guy that saved me. Get this man a raise, the patron calls, looking over his shoulder as he moves past his fellow customers and ambles towards me. I follow his gaze. He's looking right at Helia, stood with her arms folded at a nearby table. No. I lower the box at once, driving it to the floor a little rougher than I would have liked, but eager to get it out of Helia's direct line of sight. It thuds to the ground between my legs and the closest table. One of the creatures sat at it, peers over the side to look at the box with curiosity. Her nostrils flared. The scorpion man reaches me and wraps two of his arms around my shoulder. He laughs, a terrible, guttural sound with the smell of his meal hot in his breath. One of his feet kicks carelessly up against the box, but he pays it no mind. Another round of applause starts to roll around the restaurant floor, as all the patrons look my way once again. Helia is making her way over. My heart hammers in my chest. I glance feverishly down to the box. Don't move. I will its occupant. Please, please, I don't draw any attention. This was the waiter that I was telling you about. The man chortles to Helia as she approaches our position. He deserves a reward or something, is all I'm saying. Yes, Helia replies, her chin's wobbling. Quite right, sir, quite right. I was actually witness to the incident myself. She's just under two meters away now, making her way around the table towards us. What are you still doing here, John? She asks. I thought you would have made your way home by now. The applause dies down. And the customers turn back to their tables. The thick, sticky stench of the atmosphere weighs heavily down upon us all. The conversation and the munching and grinding of meals continues across the restaurant floor. But still, she approaches. I can't speak. I can't think. There is no moisture in my mouth and my tongue sticks to its roof. She comes to a stop by the box. The scorpion man has written something on a note and stuffed it into my front pocket, with a heavy pat on the back. A contact number, perhaps. A tip, or his name, I have no idea. I don't really care. I don't listen as he shares some final words with Helia. I don't watch him as he departs. I stare instead at my boss as she regards the box with curiosity. What have you got there, John? She asks, as time slows right down. I fumble for words. It's, I was just, uh, trash. I was just finishing up. Thought I would take the trash with me on my way out. I swallow. And Helia bends down to open the box's lid. I stare in horror as Helia pulls open the cardboard lid of the box to reveal nothing. The box is empty. One of these sides has become partially disconnected from the hole, 
and a strip of the deep red carpet is visible from the inside. My eyes dart to the tablecloth beside it. It reaches down almost to the floor, and it rustles. I step to the side at once, drawing Helia's gaze away. This is just an empty box, she asks, looking up at me. Um, yeah, exactly. It's just taking up space in the storeroom, so I thought I would get rid of it. No, we can use this, take it back, and then seriously, and get yourself home, okay? You've earned it. I forced a half smile. Right. And do you have that limb I asked for, by the way? Any keys to the freezer? Oh, uh, no. I bumped into a Garen on the way there, and she knows the layout better than me. Where everything isn't such, so she offered to go down instead. Thought that she might as well. She said she would take it straight to the kitchen. There is a tense pause. One of our patrons laughed at something on the opposite side of the restaurant. The sound is low and wet. Helia shrugs. All right. She pointed the box as she turns to take her leave, and I nod in response. Man, we're in the clear. For now. I allow myself a breath and then squat down to pick it up. I'll be back for you. I mutter when my face is beside the tablecloth. Stay here. And I dutifully carry the box back to the storeroom, already racking my brain for a new plan as I do so. My back is slick with sweat and my shirt sticks uncomfortably to my shoulders. I try not to think about either of the table's occupants kicking suddenly out and striking the cowering girl that hides below. What the hell has gotten into you, John? You'll be lucky if you ever make it out of here alive, let alone with the girl too. I could just leave. I could just walk out and hope that she has the wits to make her own escape. I could choose to forget all about her. I couldn't yet. I can't. I run my hands through my hair. The game is still in play. I need an excuse to stay. I take one of the empty trays from the nearest shelf and return into the restaurant. I really need a glass of water or something. I'm starting to feel lightheaded as hell. The couple at the table that hides the girl are, thankfully, nearly finished. My head over, hanging back until the second that the woman has pushed the final chunk of red brown meat into her mouth. Her tongue slithers out and licks her finger clean, along with her wrist and the lower half of her forearm. You finished up? I ask. Hastily clearing away the items on the table before I can get a response. Yes, warbles the man, rubbing his belly. The colors of his suit fade steadily in and out across his semi-skilled skin. Delightful feast. He hungrily drinks me in as he speaks. Anything else I can get for you? I ask, as required. Silently praying for a no. No, the man says, looking at his companion. I think we're done here. That'll be all. Right, I reply. I realize that I may have been a little hasty with my cleanup, and I slow down significantly, pausing and waiting, hovering by the table to see if the disgusting creatures are going to get up and leave. But instead, they decide to enter into a conversation. Table items and empty plates in hand, and hovering suspiciously as I am, I have no real choice but to return the items to the kitchen. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing now. Maybe I could hide, perhaps, or insist that I want to stay. Help the girl get away when the restaurant is less busy. She's so close. So close to the exit. For now, though, if the cannibals currently sitting at her table would kindly get out, that would be a good start. I push through into the kitchen and I'm hit by the wave of a sticky warmth. A large chunk of unidentifiable meat rotates slowly over the grill, sizzling and dripping heavy globules of grease as it turns. And there stands Agarin the waitress, holding a plastic, shrink-wrapped arm, arguing with Bertha Chef. What the heck is this? We need a leg, not a bloody arm, you idiot. He bellows over the counter and into her face. Crap. That's right, the kitchen needed a leg. What did I ask Agarin to retrieve from the freezer? Did I ask her to get a leg or an arm? Crap, 
I definitely asked her to get an arm. There's a joke in there somewhere. My mind race says, You idiot, John. You've messed this whole operation right up, haven't you? What are you going to do now? I stand there in the doorway like a moron, tray in hand. The two engaged in the argument have not yet noticed my presence. Look, says the waitress. Her three eyes narrowed in defiance. I'm just following orders. John said. John said. Since when did you take orders from that meat bag? You know, there's really no need for you to swear so much, Bert. You're not impressing anyone. For heck's sake, he roars. If you want something done, you gotta... The veins in the chef's arm bulge as he grinds his teeth, tearing off his apron and striding around the counter, snatching the keys in the plastic-wrapped severed arm from Agarin's hand as he does so. I step quickly to the side and avoid his gaze as he shoves past me, muttering angrily under his breath. I put the tray on the side, ready to be sorted and cleaned, and Agarin makes eye contact with me. She throws out her arms in exasperation, what the heck, John? She says. She looks pretty upset. I wince and mouth a sorry to her. She shakes her head, but to my great relief, says nothing further. Don't mind, Bert, says Grummy, putting a heavy hand on the waitress's shoulder. Actually, Grummy, there was one other thing, um, down in the freezer. She glances around and then pauses as if unsure as to whether it's wise to share her information, but she beckons him closer. She mutters something into his ear, and that all-too-familiar fear makes a swift and unwelcome return to my god. Oh god, did she see? Did she notice the missing girl already? Did you even remember to relock the room that you found her in, John? I'm not so sure if I did. Grummy's eyes meet mine, and I feel the color drain from my face. It's almost like I can see the cogs and gears turning in his head. There's a long and strained pause. The sounds of clattering pots and pans reverberate through the pillars of steam all around. The chef straightens. John, he calls from across the kitchen. Another pause. Yes, Grummy, I reply. He nods to a dish at the end of the counter. Helia might have dismissed you, but this is my kitchen. Take this order out, and then you're done for the evening. Table 20. Blood rushes in my ears as I step closer, heart hammering, avoiding his gaze as I take the plate in hand, along with the order slip. Table 20. But grummy, this says. Table 20, John. Grummy growls, and I nod, carrying it out and into the restaurant without another word. Table 20 it is. I've never been good under pressure. As you probably noticed, this isn't the way that I do things. I do what I'm told as neutrally and as dispassionately, but not disrespectfully as possible. Staying boring and keeping under the radar. It's worked fantastically so far. And today, well... Today might as well have screwed all that up. Save the girl. You have to save the girl. You told her to stay put under the table and she trusts you. You can't abandon her. You won't. You have to save the girl. I try not to think about what my shift is going to be like tomorrow. If I even make it to tomorrow, that is. I can't bear it. What's the best case scenario for you here, John? The girl gets away. You get home safely, and what? No one notices she's even missing. It's never mentioned. I stank my way through the restaurant to table 20. It doesn't take long. It's right at the back of the room, by the same wall that holds the kitchen doors. I do my best to hold off the wave of impending panic. Of course they'll notice she's missing. They'll absolutely notice. It looks like they already have noticed. But no one knows you were down there. Now Garen will get the blame. She's the one that went down. Grummy suspects though, doesn't he, John? You saw it in his eyes. He's got his suspicions already. Are suspicions enough? Is that all that it'll take? Would Grummy sell you out? He's your mate. Well, sort of. 
Barely. He's a monster. You saved his job, his reputation. You're a human. He cooks your kind and serves them up on a plate every single day. I feel sick. Coming to a stop at table 20, I lower the plates down in front of the patrons. About time. You expect faster service in a place like this. The closest grumbles, saliva dripping from the corners of her mouth and onto her chest. Her companion snorts and edges forward in their seat. One bulging eye fixes on me. The other swings wildly around and down to the meal before her. And two portions of cut shoulder, one with hock trimmings. I hope you enjoy. I stand up straight and turn to leave, but the creature to my immediate left grabs a hold of my arm. Not just a caress or a cellar grope, but a grab. I freeze and stare at her, immediately tensed. Waiter boy, this is not what we ordered. I hear a series of little squelches as all their eyes turn from their meals and fix themselves onto me. Her jaw quivers. The other patron snarls with frustration. And I'm sure you know we paid a great deal to guarantee our place here tonight. And I have so far been less than impressed with the quality of service. Of course, madam, my apologies. If you could just let go of my arm. She digs her fingers in tighter. I would like to speak with the owner, please. Helia. Madam, I'm afraid that that's just not possible. It's rather busy tonight, but I can go and speak with the kitchen to find out what's happened. Had they even started preparing our meals? The other whines moaning as she rubs a scaled hand across her belly. I, uh, I'm not sure. It could just be a simple mix-up. If you could just let go of my arm and I can speak with the kitchen. No. No, if you won't get the owner then, I want to speak with the chef. Bring him out here. As I said, it's a busy one tonight, but I can definitely go and ask him. Bring the chef to me now. Madam, I steal myself and clench my jaw. Gathering my courage, I stare right into her face, expression cold. Release my arm. There is a strained pause. But to my relief, she does as I say, and reluctantly releases her grip, leaving a pale and painful mark in my skin. I'll do what I can, I tell her, picking the plates back up in shaking hands and returning to the kitchen, arm throbbing as I do so. The universe is against me tonight, it would seem. I'm all over the shattered remains of my plan. I think I'm going to just tell the girl to make a run for it. I'll act surprised when I see her and claim ignorance. If she's fast, she should be able to make it out of the front door in time. Maybe I can help her move from table to table to get a little closer and prove her chances. It's not a great plan, admittedly, but I'm running out of options. I just want her out of the restaurant. I can't breathe here. My thought process is broken by the sight of Bert back in the kitchen. He's holding the leg, as requested, and muttering to Grummy. I can't hear what he's saying from here over the clamor, but his gestures are wild. He runs a hand over his bulbous head. The creature looks panicked. Honestly, I have to stop myself from releasing a bitter and self-deprecating sudden laugh. The plan, I feel, could not be going much worse. If Bert has already noticed the missing girl as well, then I really have no choice. I have to get her out of here now before they conduct a search. Grummy puts a hand out and stops Bert mid-sentence. He looks at me and nods down at the full plates of food that I carry in my hands. What's the issue, John? He grunts. They claim that this isn't what they ordered, Grummy. I put the plates of steamy meat back on the counter. They want to talk to you, but I told them that since it was busy, you probably wouldn't. No, he says to my surprise. It's fine, I'll go talk to them. Bert starts spluttering, but Grummy simply puts down his knife and points the chef back to the cookers. Keep things run for me, Bert. I'll be back. The creature seems irritated to have had his concerns put on hold, but also rather pleased to have been granted this temporary authority. He mutters to himself but returns to work, grunting orders to the other chefs. Grummy puts a heavy hand on my shoulder as we walk back into the main lobby. I wonder if he can feel the layers of sweat that have permeated through the material. 
Get back to work for now, John. I'll handle this. Stay sharp. Stay sharp. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Is that a threat? I murmur in response and allow myself a breath as he releases me. He heads off to the right to the problem table, and I turn left to make my return to the one that hides the girl. The occupying patrons are standing up, thank God, pushing their chairs underneath and heading for the door. Thank you, the female says, and the male nods at me. They loop their arms as they walk the length of the carpet to the entrance, and their eyes squelch as they retract into their heads. I watch as their skin hardens and shifts through a wheel of colors, their camouflaged clothing returning, rolls of flesh shivering and creasing to give the impression of folds in the fabric. The female pulls on a pair of gloves and her gnarled, four-fingered hands are hidden from view. They push on out through the doors and then the doors behind and into the evening cold and a little gust of cool wind is blown into the restaurant as they do so. Just another couple out to dinner, I think to myself, and the moment passes. I reach for the tip that they have left in the center of the table and accidentally fumble the coins, dropping them to the floor. I quickly glance around and then crouch to the ground to pick them back up, muttering through the tablecloth as I do so. They've gone, I whisper. And we're going to get you out of here, okay? I lift up the corner of the tablecloth and see the girl huddled tight between the chairs, staring back at me, wide-eyed and shivering. On my signal, you run, okay? I lift the tablecloth a little higher. You see the entrance. She nods. On my signal, you make a break for it. Run for the doors as fast as you can and don't stop. Get as far from here as you can, you understand? She nods again. Okay, all right. I lower the tablecloth again and stand up straight, taking a step back, heart pounding like crazy. Everything seems to slow right down. I take in all the general murmur and chortling of the cannibals all around, the deep red decor of the restaurant walls and floor, the chomping of jaws and the splattering of meats across the tablecloth. I take a note of the bustle through the steamy windows to the kitchen at the far end of the room, and I realize that this is it. One way or another, I have acted against my programming and I am now, for better or for worse, going to have to deal with the consequences. Here we go. I glance down as the tablecloth stirs. The edge lifts up ever so slightly, and I see the girl peer out from below, watching me, waiting for the signal. My heart hammers. I clench my fist, and a voice bellows my name from across the restaurant floor. John, comes the roar. I turn to stare at its source, as indeed it does everyone else. It's grummy, anger right across his face, staring right at me. The silence falls. I stare at the chef in surprise. I don't know how to react. I don't know what's happening. I've had it, you hear me? I've had it with you, you bloody meatbag. Movement in the corner of my eye draws my attention. Helia strides from one of the adjoining corridors and out into the restaurant. Grummy, she says, astounded. What's going on? Grummy raises an accusatory finger at me from across the restaurant. All the eyes in the room turn to look at me, and then flicker right back as the chef resumes speaking. I have had it. I've had it with this incompetent waste of space. If I was given a penny for every time this meatbag screwed up, I'd be able to well retire tomorrow. I'm lost for words. What is he doing? What is he talking about? Helia glances at me. She puts out her hands, laughs awkwardly, and tries to calm the situation down. John is an unconventional employee, as we all will know, but he does his duties. You haven't seen the things that I've seen, Helia. The things of menace. I want him gone, and do you hear me? Gone. I'm sick and tired of having him in my kitchen. So, it's time to decide. It's either him or me. Realization strikes like a bolt of lightning. Don't you see, John? Don't you see what he's doing? He's playing an act. He's giving you your out. He's going to bring an end to your contract. He's setting you free. 
I stand there gaping, unsure how to respond. A patron springs up from a seat. It's the Scorpion Man, the one with the fangs and the fly-like eyes. He points the two arms of his closest side right at me. This human saved my life, he bellows. I don't care what else he might have done. He's more than earned his place here. You can't fire him, you can't. The female that grabbed my wrist at table 20 rises in turn. He's incompetent. What else can you expect from a sack of flesh? Can their kind even read? Get him out. Chaos takes hold. More of the customers jump to their feet. Chairs are knocked to the floor as the clamor grows in volume. He's nothing but polite. I couldn't care about his bloody background. It brings down the tone of the restaurant having him here. It's a disgrace. He should be sacked. How am I supposed to focus on my meal when I can see him strutting around, wafting his scent right next to me? It's maddening. Now. The moment is now. Grummy roars again, shouting and gesticulating and drawing much of the attention of the room as he does so. And I look down at the erased edge of the tablecloth before me. I look at the girl. I look into her eyes. Go, I murmur. And she does. Like a hare, she bursts from the tablecloth and rockets across the room. The red of the apron that covers her is close to the red of the carpet, and amongst the havoc, she is not obvious, not obvious at all. I watch her go with unblinking eyes and jaws clenched tight. I watch her push through the entrance doors, and then through the doors beyond, and out and away into the night. And then she's gone. The girl has escaped, and I breathe. But I'm not the only one who saw her go. My eyes meet Grummy's. His face passes through a quick and passionate cycle of emotions. Confusion, surprise, indignation, anger, and then bitter amusement perhaps, maybe even a little guilt. He clenches his jaw. He narrows his eyes. All right, I think that's quite enough, shouts Celia, her chins bobbling. Hush returns to the restaurant. The patrons settle awkwardly back into their seats, and she turns to me. My eyes leave Grummy's and me with hers. John, tell me, how long have you been with us? About a year now, ma'am, I reply. She nods. We listen to the wind whistle beyond the walls. And you've served us well. From my perspective at least, as understood by the terms of our contract, I had been hoping that you would continue to work for us for a further few years, but she shoots a look over to Grummy. But I can't lose my head chef, I just can't. So, unless you would care to change your mind, Grummy, the customers look from me to Helia to Grummy. The tension hangs like a great weight in the air. Please, mate, I think to him. Come on, Grummy. Just let this one go, please. Let this one go. And Grummy frowns, and then he sighs, and rubs a hand over his head. I just want him gone, Helia. Get him out of here. I let out a breath. In that case, John, says Helia bitterly, your contract is hereby terminated. Thank you for your service. The sign on the door and its copies across the walls of the restaurant collapse at once. They fall from their pins as if knocked by a great forest and shatter against the carpet, dissolving instantly into nothing more than piles of dust. I watch as the pupils of every single creature in that restaurant dilate at once. I edge towards the door, taking off my apron as I do so and hanging it over a nearby chair. I understand. I reply in a shaky voice. I look to Grummy. I understand. Still facing the room, I back up and out of the door. Goodbye, I murmur, as the nearest patrons hungrily lick their lips. Saliva bubbles at the edges of their mouth as their lips peel back to reveal the rows of gray-green, blood-stained teeth behind. I push out into the cold of the winter's night, and I run. I run away, and I don't look back. Thus concluded my time as the only human employee of a restaurant for cannibals. 
And yes, before you say so, I know that they aren't technically cannibals as such. Or do I? Because the creatures I served in that terrible place all had their own unique set of monstrous features. They all shared the bulging eyes and the salivating jaws and the semi-skilled skin. But they also shared a myriad of strikingly human qualities. And not just physical ones either. I haven't written off the possibility that they were humans once, or something like them, long ago perhaps. It's food for thought, if you'll pardon the pun. I saw the girl again shortly after my final shift. She was happy to see me. Her name's Erin, by the way. I roughly corroborated the story she gave to her parents and to the police, though I dressed the creatures up as people smugglers rather than flesh-eating monsters. The place was raided within the day, but there was nothing there, just an empty and run-down old building in ruin. Had the restaurant always looked like that to the untrained eye? Was I simply unable to see it for what it truly was, now that my contract had expired? Or had the restaurant moved on, to somewhere else in another city perhaps? I do not know. I may never know. But as I stand here now on the edge of the street, coat drawn about my shoulders and empty can of petrol by my feet, I think perhaps that I do not care. As the sun rises on a new morning, I watch the building go up in flames. I watch the fire dance in the windows. I watch the roof collapse in on itself with a burst of thick black smoke. I am free now, yes. But the knowledge of this place of nightmares will haunt me for the rest of my life. I do not know where they acquire the humans for their fees. I'd assume that they had a farm of sorts, at some hidden location maybe. The girls, a swift return to her family in the city, however, threw some doubt over that theory. I wonder why Grummy chose to allow me to leave. Why he chose to stay silent when he saw the girl escape. I'm thankful for his decision, and don't get me wrong, but it troubles me that I am no longer able to consider the creatures I interacted with as simply monsters in black and white. They were monsters, of course, and yet, and yet, I shake my head. I was around them for far too long, far too long indeed. I picked up the empty can of petrol and walk on into the bright and sparkling dawn of the day. There's work to be done. I need to find myself a new job, after all.